Member Mike Check testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Witness table microphone check testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Witness mic check, testing one, two, three, setting audio levels for the court reporter, one, two, three, four, five, way back here, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Member mic check, testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven.
the 60s. The moon.
Subcommittee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on the weaponization of the federal government. We welcome our witnesses and we'll introduce you here in a second and swear you in. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Kentucky to lead us all in the pledge. So if you all stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. <clears throat> we appreciate the enthusiasm. The, uh, we will now begin uh, today's hearing with opening statements. I'll start with the chair. One of the most egregious forms of the weaponization that this subcommittee has worked to expose is the coercion of social media companies by the federal government. And we wouldn't know anything that we know today. We wouldn't have learned and had the reports we've had without the work of Matt Taibbi, Michael Schellenberger, Barry Weiss, and other journalists who wrote the Twitter files and first exposed the, uh, these efforts. Their important work was first made possible because of Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter and his commitment to free speech. The path for getting this information, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the path for getting this information out has not been easy. Finding the truth never is. Instead, we were obstructed at almost every turn, and many of the people who sought to help us expose the censorship industrial complex as Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger have, I think, appropriately labeled it, have been targeted. On December 10th of 2022, after the first Twitter files came out, Mr. Musk tweeted that Twitter is, quote, that Twitter is both a social media company and a crime scene. Three days later, three days later, the Federal Trade Commission sent Elon Musk a letter demanding to know the identity of the Twitter files authors and inundated the company with harassing requests for information, literally three days after. Name four journalists by name. And while Twitter put this information out voluntarily, the other platforms were not as forthcoming. Instead, we had to subpoena them in February of this year, fought with them for months, had to threaten contempt before getting substantive information about government's efforts to censor the American people. And when we first had Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger testify back in March, an IRS agent showed up at Matt Taibbi's door. I mean, think about this. I, I've told this story numerous times, and there's not one person I've told this story to, not one group I've spoken to, where I say, while they are testifying, while Mr. Taibbi is testifying in front of the committee about the weaponization of government, the IRS was actually, at that very moment, knocking on his door. There's not one person who thinks that was just chance. That just happened to, you know, it was all a coincidence. Not one person, believe, everyone understands that to be the intimidation from our federal government. Now, the good news is this led to a sweeping investigation of the IRS's home visits. And the best news is the IRS has said they will no longer be making unannounced visits to American citizens' homes. It's interesting that the commissioner actually said, the commissioner actually said, we are doing this to protect for the security of our agents. Baloney, they're doing it because we caught them. And we made an issue of it. And the American people understand that that is wrong. This subcommittee's work has also included putting out reports showing how CISA went from a cybersecurity agency into the disinformation police and how the FBI coordinated with a compromised Ukrainian intelligence agency, that actually happened, to censor Americans. We were also able to expose how the other platforms were pressured to change their behavior. Documents we obtained from Facebook so that the company felt threatened by the White House directly and changed its behavior for fear of retribution. And just this morning, we released information showing the same thing happened with YouTube. While we have more information forthcoming, it's impossible to get a full accounting of the government's censorship efforts when the government actors involved will not participate with our constitutional duty to do oversight. That's why today we are serving subpoenas to former White House employees Rob Flaherty and Andy Slavitt, who have so far refused to sit for interviews despite being directly implicated in emails between the White House and tech companies. I think we might have brought this out in the, in the previous hearing with um, some of our witnesses today. But never forget, the third day of the Biden administration, I think it was maybe, maybe in like 36 hours into it, Andy Slavitt sends an email from the White House to Twitter saying, take down this tweet ASAP. And of course, the irony was the tweet was about, the tweet was from 
this administration's Democrat primary opponent, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And there was nothing in the tweet that was false, and yet the White House, day three, the Biden administration is trying to take that down. So we've sent subpoenas to those two individuals and hope that we will have them in front of our committee real soon. I wanna thank our witnesses for appearing before us today and helping us to continue our work in exposing government censorship, in exposing what two of our witnesses have called, as I said earlier, the censorship industrial complex, this marriage of big government, big tech, and as we found out with some of our work, big academia involved in attacking American citizens' First Amendment liberties. We appreciate you all being here. We will introduce you here in a, in a, in a, in a few minutes, but I now yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, may I ask unanimous consent that the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, a member of the full committee, be permitted to sit on the dais. She's yeah. not going to ask any questions. Yeah, without objection. Thank you very much. Um, good day to everyone. Every day, the American people share with members of Congress, social media friends, family, and anyone who will listen that they live largely in fear for their future. When I scroll through my social media feeds, I see people worried they don't have job opportunities or job security the generation before them had, worried they don't have time, resources, or support to take care of sick parents or disabled relatives, worried they won't be able to afford to buy a home to call their own, worried they will not be able to see their kids send their children to college or simply provide for their children the way they were provided for. I see Americans are concerned. I see parents concerned that schools are becoming unsafe for their children. I see Americans are concerned that rights are being taken away. Americans concerned that their vote might be discounted or may not even be able to cast a vote. In the discussion of the weaponization of the federal government, the majority has acknowledged the fact, in this discussion of the weaponization of government, I'm sorry, um, one of the things that I've requested that we look into is the IRS audits of working class people and people of color, which are far, far at a higher rate than millionaires and billionaires, or a discussion in a hearing of actions by the former President Donald Trump and what he has said he will do to weaponize our government if reelected. However, we're not having a hearing about those topics. We're not having discussions. Congress is not engaged in making any headway on those things that Americans are most concerned with. Today, we're having a hearing with witnesses on the Republican side, two of whom we've already heard from. In fact, this is the second hearing where Republicans have brought out repeat witnesses, the second hearing in a row. In preparation for the 2024 presidential election, Republicans on this, this committee want to entrench their theory of social media censorship, their unfounded accusation that social media companies are colluding with the government to censor conservative voices. There's no evidence of this collusion, and in fact, this committee has heard closed-door testimony from 29 witnesses who have said on the record, government, as well as social media individuals, that the alleged collusion and supposed censorship claimed by the committee Republicans has not taken place. But Republicans won't release that testimony, and they are not being honest with the American people. Because as they ramp up their own misinformation campaign before the 2024 election, they need free reign to elevate hate, to engage in voter suppression online, in addition to their normal in-person voter suppression tactics. This hearing suits political purposes. Republicans are holding the same hearing all over again for one simple reason. They want to distract from the actual threat of the weaponization of government on the American people. That is Donald Trump. In the past few months, Trump has said that he would reinstate the Muslim travel ban. In fact, his exact words were, when I return to office, the travel ban is coming back even bigger than before and stronger than before. He has vowed to use the Department of Justice to investigate his political enemies. He has said that those who oppose him should be executed for treason. 
He has called his political opponents cockroaches, vermin, said that immigrants are poisoning American society. He has promised to use the Insurrection Act to mobilize the military against any protesters who speak out against him if he wins re-election. Those do not resonate as plans of a democratic leader. They sound like a dictator. They promise to be one who will silence his enemies and hold on to power at any cost. As the first branch of government, it is our job to be a check on that kind of undemocratic, unstable rhetoric in this republic. Donald Trump's statements are outrageous, and this committee and every member that serves on it should be outraged by them. And every American should be outraged at this committee by not having hearings on that. Many want to shield a man who, as many experts have identified, as spouting rhetoric cribbed from Nazi regime, calling his enemies cockroaches and vermin, saying that those who oppose him are poisoning the blood of America, and even calling for the execution of people who simply speak out against him. For four years, this man implemented loyalty tests, called for violence against his opponents, pardoned his friends, tried to illegally keep people out of the country because of their religious beliefs. He shoved children in cages, tried to illegally deploy the United States military to put down peaceful Black Lives Matter protests, and systematically dismantle the civil rights protections afforded to all Americans. And if he comes back, that will just be the start. That is why he has very clearly said what he would do over and over. Beyond loyalty tests, he plans to purge the government of all career officials and national security advisors who questions them. He plans to indict anyone who runs against him. He plans to silence protesters with the use of military force. He plans to make this country his, not the American's people. These plans will not just impact those who work in government. His plans are going to undermine the safety of every American when he appoints national security officials because they are loyal to him, not because they understand national security. They're going to impact people in areas that need support if he feels that they didn't vote against him. These plans are going to hurt men and women bravely serving in our military and law enforcement who are going to be forced to choose between carrying out fundamentally illegal constitutional orders and losing their job. Today we have Ms. Troy before us as a witness who has bravely spoken out to tell the world how Trump's White House had a culture of fear, how he had dictator-like tweets and statements, how he incited his followers to violence, and how he orchestrated detailed plans to spin his conspiracies into action by his followers. And she can say this with authority because she was there. She is a Republican who was in the Trump administration. When she says he means what he says, or that he will do everything in his power to make his dangerous promises come true, she speaks from experience. To the use the words of the former United States Poet Laureate, Dr. Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. And Ms. Troy, I wanna apologize in advance for any attacks made against you today, which I'm sure will come, or afterwards. I wanna thank you for your bravery coming forward and testifying today and speaking truth at all times, to be worried more about America than you are about winning. I yield back. The gentleman yields back without objection. All other opening statements will be included in the record. Let's, uh, we will now introduce uh, today's witnesses. Mr. Matt Taibbi is a journalist and author. He's one of the authors of the Twitter files previously worked uh, for Rolling Stone. He also has written several books about American politics and culture. He won the Izzy Award for Independent Journalism in 2020 and the Dow Prize for, uh, from the National Journalism Center for his work on the Twitter files. I appreciate you being here today, Mr. Ty. Mr. Michael Schellenberger is also a journalist, author, and one of the authors of the Twitter files. He has co-founded several nonprofits, including the Breakthrough uh, Institute, Environmental Progress, and the California Peace Coalition. His work often 
focuses on crime and drug policy, homelessness, and the climate. Mr. Schellenberger has also won uh, the, the Dow Prize and was named a Hero of the Environment by Time Magazine in 2008. We welcome uh, Mr. Schellenberger as well. Ms. Rupa Subramanya, pretty close, I think. Uh, uh, Ms. Subramanya is a journalist for the Free Press. She is based in Canada and has lived or worked in India, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. Her work has previously appeared in the Wall Street Journal and Foreign Policy, and she has been cited in the Financial Times and the New York Times. And we welcome you as well. Ms. Olivia Troy, who the ranking member just mentioned uh, and talked about, is a former national security official having served at the Department of Homeland Security in the intelligence community and at the Department of Defense. She served as Homeland Security uh, and counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Mike Pence, and we welcome you as well. We will now uh, begin by swearing you in. Would you all please stand, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that each of the witnesses has answered in the uh, affirmative. You can be seated, thank you. Um, please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony uh, in five minutes, give or take. We're, 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 we'll be a little lenient, of course. Uh, the microphone in front of you has a clock and a series of lights, and you know how this works, red, green, yellow. It gets to yellow, start winding it down, gets to red, then you've got a few extra, little extra time, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll stop. But we'll, we'll, we'll be lenient with that. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with uh, Mr. Schellenberger. Let's, well, let, let, yeah, let's start with Mr. Schellenberger. We'll work, work right down the, the line. So, uh, Mr. Schellenberger, you're rest, rec recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting my testimony. Nine months ago, I testified and provided evidence to the subcommittee about the existence of a censorship industrial complex, a network of government agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, government contractors, and big tech media platforms that conspired to censor ordinary Americans and elected officials alike for holding disfavored views. I regret to inform the subcommittee today that the scope, power, and lawbreaking of the censorship industrial complex are even worse than we had realized back in March. Two days ago, my colleagues and I published the first batch of internal files from the Cyber Threat Intelligence League, which show US and UK military contractors working in 2019 and 2020 to both censor and turn sophisticated psychological operations and disinformation tactics developed abroad against the American people. Many insist that all that we identified in the Twitter files, the Facebook files, and the CTI files were legal activities by social media platforms to take down content that violated the terms of service. Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, and other big tech companies are privately owned, people point out, and free to censor content. And government officials are free to point out wrong information, they argue. But the First Amendment prohibits the government from abridging freedom of speech the Supreme Court has ruled that the government may not induce, encourage, or promote private persons to accomplish what is constitutionally forbidden to accomplish, and there's now a large body of evidence proving that the government did precisely that. What's more, the whistleblower who delivered the CTIL files to us says that its leader, a quote-unquote former British intelligence analyst, was quote-unquote in the room at the Obama White House in 2017 when she received the instructions to create a counter disinformation project to quote, stop a repeat of 2016. The US Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, CISA, has been at the center, been the center of gravity for much of the censorship, with the National Science Foundation financing the development of censorship and disinformation tools and other federal government agencies playing a supportive role. Emails from CISA's NGO and social media partners show that CISA created the Election Integrity Partnership, EIP, in 2020, which involved the Stanford Internet Observatory and other US government contractors. EIP and its successor, the Virality Project, urged Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms to censor social media posts by ordinary citizens and elected officials alike. EIP reported, that they had a 75% response rate from the platforms and that 35% of the URLs that they reported were either removed, labeled, um, or throttled, or soft blocked. In 2020, the Department of Homeland Security, CISA, violated the First Amendment and interfered in the election, while in 2021, CISA and the White House violated the First Amendment and undermined America's response to the COVID pandemic by demanding that Facebook and Twitter 
censor content that Facebook said, that Facebook itself said was quote unquote often true, including about vaccine side effects. All of this is profoundly un-American. One's commitment to free speech means nothing if it does not extend to your political enemies. In his essential new book, Liar in a Crowded Theater, Jeff Kosef, a law professor at the United States Naval Academy, shows that the widespread view that the government can censor false speech and or speech that quote unquote causes harm is mostly wrong. The Supreme Court has allowed very few constraints on speech. For example, the test of incitement to violence remains its immediacy. I encourage Congress to defund and dismantle the government organizations involved in censorship. That includes phasing out all funding for the National Science Foundation's Track F, Trust and Authenticity in Communication Systems, and its Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace Track. I would also encourage Congress to abolish CISA in DHS. Short of taking those steps, I would encourage significant guardrails and oversight to prevent such censorship from happening again. In particular, it's very easy to see the line in CISA. They say they're covering physical security, cybersecurity, but they added a third one, cognitive security, which is basically attempting to control the information environment and how people think about the world, including the stories that they tell. Finally, I would encourage Congress to consider making Section 230 liability protections contingent upon social media platforms known in the law as interactive computer services to allow adult users to moderate our own legal content through filters that we choose and whose algorithms are transparent to all of us. I would encourage Congress to prohibit government officials from asking the platforms to remove content, which the Supreme Court may or may not rule on constitutional next year when it decides on the Missouri v. Biden case. Should the court somehow decide that the government requests for censorship are constitutional, then I would urge Congress to require such requests be reported publicly instantaneously so that such censorship demands occur in plain sight. Thank you very much for hearing my testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Shelmer. Mr. Taibbi, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Make sure you got the mic on there. Thank you, Chairman Jordan. Hit, hit the mic there if you could. Uh, uh, just hit the button there. There we go. Right, sir. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of the committee uh, for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Exactly one year ago today, um, I had my first look at the documents that came to be known as the Twitter files. We've learned a lot since then. When Michael and I testified before uh, the good people of this committee in March, we both talked about how this isn't a partisan issue at all, uh, despite the fact that it's been uh, repeatedly described as a right-wing conspiracy theory or, or a right-wing fantasy. Uh, we found evidence of suppression of movements on both sides, uh, including leftist movements like the Yellow Vests, uh, parties like the Green Party, organizations like Consortium Magazine. Just this week, Michael and I reported on the group um, that he talked about, the CTI League, and in those documents, we found evidence of monitoring uh, groups like the Democratic Socialists of America, hashtags like Healthcare for All. The nature of censorship programs is that they tend to expand in all directions, and these uh, programs already have. As someone who voted for Democrats his whole life and who got his ideas about speech issues from people like Senator Frank Church, Paul Wellstone, and Dennis Kucinich, I believe also that there's a less obvious but more important reason that people across the spectrum should care about this issue. And the former executive director of the ACLU, Ira Glasser, once explained to a group of students why he didn't support hate speech codes on campuses. The problem, he said, wasn't the speech. The, the, the problem was, quote, who gets to decide what's hateful? Who gets to decide what to ban? Because, quote, most of the time, it ain't you. <laughs> the story that came out in the Twitter files, and for which more evidence surfaced in both the Missouri v. Biden lawsuit and this committee's Facebook files releases and in the CTI League documents, they all speak directly uh, to Eric Glasser's concerns. There's been a dramatic shift in attitudes about speech in this country, and many politicians now clearly believe the bulk of Americans can't be trusted to digest information on their own. This mindset imagines that if we see one clip from RT, we'll stop being patriots, that once exposed to hate speech, we'll become bigots ourselves automatically, that if we read even one 
Donald Trump tweet will become insurrectionists. Having come to this conclusion, the government agencies like the DHS and the FBI and the quasi-private agencies uh, who do anti-disinformation work have taken upon themselves the paternalistic responsibility to sort out for us what is and is not safe. While they see great danger in allowing others to read controversial material, it's taken for granted that they themselves will be immune to the dangers of speech. This leads to the one inescapable question about these new anti-disinformation programs that is never discussed, but needs to be. Who does this work? Stanford's Election Integrity Project helpfully made a graphic showing the quote-unquote external stakeholders involved in their content review operation. It showed four columns, government, civil society, platforms, and media. There's one group that's conspicuously absent from that list, people, ordinary people. Whether America continues the informal sub-Rosa censorship system uh, we've seen in the, Twitter in the Twitter files or the Facebook files, or whether it formally adopts something like Europe's draconian New Digital Services Act, it's already abundantly clear who won't be involved in this kind of work. There'll be no dock workers doing content flagging, no poor people from inner city neighborhoods, no single moms pulling multiple waitressing jobs, no immigrant store owners or Uber drivers. These programs will always feature a tiny, rarefied sliver of affluent professional class Americans censoring a huge and ever-expanding pool of everyone else. Take away the highfalutin talk about countering hate and reducing harm, and anti-disinformation is just a bluntly elitist gatekeeping exercise. If you prefer to think in progressive terms, it's class war. If one small demographic over here has broad control over the whole speech landscape, and a great big one over there has no control whatsoever, it follows that one of those groups will end up with more political power than the other. Which one is the, is the winner? To paraphrase Ira Glasser, it probably ain't yours. It isn't just one side or the other that will lose if these programs are allowed to continue. It's pretty much everyone, which is why these programs must be defunded before it's too late. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chavi. Uh, well done. Uh, Ms. Subramanya, you are well, uh, recognized now for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Jordan. I'm pleased to be able to join you today to testify on the importance of free expression. I'd like all of you to think of me as a time traveler from the not too distant future, coming back to the present to offer you a glimpse of what could lie ahead for America. I live in a time in which, in the name of fairness, you can't share the stories you write for my news publication on social media. I live in a time in which, in the name of the common good, you can be kicked out of your bank and online payment system simply for expressing the wrong political views. I live in a time in which, in the name of social justice, you can commit a serious crime but get a more lenient sentence if you happen to be the right skin color. I live in a time in which, in the name of safety, you can be arrested for exercising your right to peaceful protest if you happen to be protesting the wrong thing. Of course, I'm not a real time traveler, I just live in Canada. Americans, and perhaps those in this chamber, surely think Canadians are too nice, we're too polite to embrace this sort of proto-authoritarianism. But it's more accurate to say that our niceness made us susceptible to the new authoritarianism, undermining the foundations of our liberal democracy. If it sounds like I'm overstating things, allow me to share three stories that illustrate this creeping authoritarianism. First. A few months ago, I reported a story from my publication, The Free Press, about a high school principal in Toronto who had been humiliated in front of his colleagues by a DEI consultant. The principal's crime, besides being white and male, was that he objected to the consultant's assertion that Canada is a less just society than America. The humiliation he experienced ultimately led him to commit suicide. I wanted to share that story on Facebook. When I tried to, I was barred from posting it. I received a message that stated, in response to Canadian government legislation, news content can't be shared. I was confused. Then I remembered the recently adopted Online News Act. The law forces social media companies to pay online media companies to link to their content. Facebook, instead of paying for that content, barred its users from posting it. Government officials insist that this is only a matter of fairness, a way of making sure that media companies are compensated for the news they report. 
But really, this new law props up legacy media dinosaurs like the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, Bell Media, and other companies, which are subsidized by the federal government, and all of which can be counted on to echo Justin Trudeau's worldview and toe the party line. Not being able to post was annoying, but it wasn't the end of the world for me. I don't depend on Facebook for my income. The same cannot be said of Christopher Curtis, which brings me to my second story. Chris is a 38-year-old renegade journalist, entrepreneur in Montreal who runs a digital newsletter called The Rover. He calls himself woke. You might think that he's exactly the kind of journalist the Trudeau government would elevate. He's on the political left. He publishes stories about the plight of the homeless and police brutality. The problem is that, unlike government-funded news companies, independent media companies are truly independent, which means they report stories that don't comport with whatever the government wants them to report. For example, in September 2020, the rover reported a story on federal mistreatment of Mohawk Indians. This month, it published a story about migrant workers who had been abused and trafficked with the unwitting help of the federal government. But under this new law, the rover can't build its audience. Unable to post content on Facebook or Instagram, the newsletter can't reach new, new subscribers. It cannot grow its subscriber base. This is a slow death, says Chris. For now, he's unsure how he's going to support his partner and their three-year-old daughter. He's thinking of going back into construction, which takes me to my third story. Danny Bulford, now 41, used to be an officer in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the equivalent of the FBI. For years, he was a sniper in the Prime Minister's protective detail. Then, in 2021, Danny quit because he didn't want to get his COVID vaccination. In early 2022, truckers descended on Ottawa to protest new COVID vaccine requirements. Danny joined them. The government declared a state of emergency. Danny, like many demonstrators, was arrested and later released without charge. Then something chilling happened. On February 17, 2022, Danny logs into his bank accounts, starting with his checking and savings accounts at the CIBC. But instead of seeing his balance, he had about $160,000 in there. The only thing he saw was a dash. Then he logs onto Scotiabank to see about an additional checking account. Once again, there was no sign of any money in his account. Finally, he logs into the Royal Bank of Canada, which handles his MasterCard account, and he was told he had no access to any credit. Danny's wife was also unable to access any of these accounts. Suddenly, they were worrying about how to cover their next mortgage payments and how to feed their three kids. That is what it means to be debanked. Debanking has been one of the Trudeau government's weapon of choice. Since 2018, it has frozen the accounts of more than 800 Canadians who did things it didn't approve of, including those of 280 who took part in the truckers' protest, which the government regarded as illegitimate. Soon after, Danny moved his money out of the big banks and into local credit unions, hoping it would be safer there. The worst part of this, Danny told me, is not believing in the country I spent my career serving. It's this feeling that we're being watched, torn apart, made to feel like the much hated other in our own country. Canada was once a bastion of free expression, but now not so much. Consider that at the same time the government and its corporate allies are curbing the free expression of truckers and journalists, the government is defending the rights of pro-Palestinian demonstrators, many of whom traffic in what can only be called anti-Semitism. Think about that. Vaccine skepticism, not okay. Peddling medieval blood libel legends about Jews, okay. I'm all for protecting free speech. I'm from the free press. I just want that protection applied fairly. I also want to be clear, these are just a handful of hundreds of stories I could have picked. What is happening in Canada is a gradual suffocation of free expression. It is draped in a cloak of niceness, inclusivity, and justice, but it is regressive, authoritarian, and illiberal. I came here today not simply to warn you about what lies ahead, but to plead with you to do something about it. Now is not the time to be polite. Now is the time to defend loudly the liberties and rights that have given us the greatest freedoms in human history. Across the world right now, governments in the name of the good are considering or adopting measures like we have in Canada. Look at Dublin. They're about to enact a draconian hate crime, hate crime bill that poses a dire threat to free speech. In, in Paris, President Emmanuel Macron has called for censoring online speech. This is to say nothing of Russia, China, and Iran. America is so exceptional, indispensable, really. Please do not succumb to the same illiberalism, authoritarianism. Please keep fighting for what you know is right. Canada is watching. The world is watching. Thank you. Well said, thank you. Very well said. Ms. Troy, you're recognized for five minutes, and we'll give you a little extra if you need it. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The threat of weaponization of the federal government is a serious topic, 
that requires sober analysis. Unfortunately, what we see here today and what we have seen from this committee over the past year is instead a politically motivated fantasy detached from reality. Members of this committee and their witnesses make grand and vague accusations about government censorship, but those foggy allegations are refuted by the facts that private social media companies moderating content on their own, private platforms, is not government censorship. It is those private companies exercising their own First Amendment rights to rid their platforms of misinformation. In my experience as a national security official, the federal government strictly adhered to the First Amendment by advising and assisting social media platforms in combating misinformation, while the ultimate decision about what action, if any, to take rested solely with the platforms themselves. I know what real weaponization of the federal government looks like because I've seen it with my own eyes. I worked in the Trump White House, where I served as Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor to Vice President Mike Pence. On numerous occasions, I witnessed President Trump and his allies attempt to use the powers of the presidency to further his private political agenda at the expense of the American people. Trump administration officials attempt attempted to manipulate intelligence assessments to support its ban on nationals from Muslim countries entering the United States. They delayed natural disaster aid to blue states who had not supported President Trump's election. In the early days of the pandemic, they resisted sending federal assistance to New York as thousands of innocent Americans suffered. Instead of continuing to spread conspiracy theories about government censorship, this committee should instead focus on the very real and very dangerous threat posed by the leading Republican candidate openly threatening to use every lever of presidential power against his political opponents if he returns to the White House. Former President Trump has promised, quote, retribution against those who have wronged and betrayed him and his political movement. He has pledged to, quote, root out the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. Trump has called the press the enemy of the people and has vowed to, quote, come down hard on MSNBC and make them pay, quote, for its critical coverage of him. He has promised to, quote, arrest his political opponents, saying he would have no choice, lock them up. He has said that his own chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff committed treason and that, quote, in times gone by, the punishment would have been death. Most ominously, he has called for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution, his words. As a lifelong Republican, I have dedicated my entire career to protecting Americans from terrorist attacks, regardless of their partisan affiliation. Former President Trump's menacing promise to wield the powers of government as a weapon against his political adversaries poses a grave threat to the rule of law in the United States of America. The American people deserve that their representatives in Congress see that threat and speak to it honestly instead of the political theater we see here today. I welcome the committee's questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Troy. We will now go to the uh, five minute questions from the members. We will start with the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Issa, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I want to note the appearance of President Trump uh, by the ranking member and uh, by one witness. Today is not about President Trump. The actions that occurred during his administration are available for everyone to look at. Our witnesses today are asking and answering effectively questions about uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the effects of suppression of free speech. <clears throat> and uh, as, a, uh, of a, as a father of a, uh, a Canadian daughter-in-law, uh, I want to thank you for making people understand that that well-liked, nice country to our north can also make the kinds of mistakes that we seem to be making. So one of the questions that, that I have is, two of you have been here before, and I think it's important to ask, you mentioned some of the current activities as you continue to monitor it, and you particularly mentioned the, uh, the protest and the activities related to Israel's uh, attempt to get back its hostages. Can you elaborate on some of the specifics uh, 
that you think you see here in the way of either suppression or amplification? Um, is, there, is there any evidence that we're continuing to see, if you will, a bias that social media doesn't have a problem reporting one side, but does have a problem reporting the other side? Um, I know it's a tough question. Yeah. I mean, we've certainly, I mean, I think we've all seen calls for, I mean, I think to Matt's point that this is not a partisan issue, that we should all, that the test of your commitment to free speech is that you would like to see the, the speech that you really despise protected and that you would defend it. And I think we've seen calls for censoring pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas speech and have been disturbed by that and, and Rupa has described that and we've also seen uh, calls for censorship of the other side. We've seen misinformation spread on all sides. So I think that what you're hearing from us is a, is a general call that, that everybody needs to just calm down and remember that this country's greatness is really founded on that protection for that kind of, that protection of speech that we all might consider to be hateful. I always remind people that, you know, one of the most, some of the most important uh, court decisions by the Supreme Court were protecting the speech of neo-Nazis in the Brandenburg decision, in the decision by Sk in Skogie. If we can tolerate neo-Nazis marching through neighborhoods of Holocaust survivors, certainly I think we're capable of tolerating uh, people defending and, uh, <clears throat> violent attacks. And that brings us to a question. As we bring you back here and some new witnesses, uh, do we have a challenge in America that we're constantly looking at what should be censured, censored rather than how do we get more free speech so that the contra uh, opinions are heard as loudly as those who yell uh, and are heard the first time. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's important to remember that the First Amendment not only guarantees um, people the right to speak and voice their opinions, but it also guarantees um, the right of all of us to hear those opinions. Uh, that, that's a crucial element of the promise. So, uh, so that, that goes to a follow-up. If that's the case, your suggestion about uh, a, a instantaneous and transparent uh, uh, unveiling of any and all reduction, throttling, et cetera, let's assume for a moment it's technically possible quickly. I, I, it's certainly possible, but let's just say it was technically possible quickly. We're a legislative body. Do you believe it's appropriate for us in a Transparency Act to mandate that this happen so that we no longer have the kind of things that happened to the chairman where he simply was systematically throttled so that he wasn't censured, censored, he simply wasn't heard very loudly. Uh, if we had had that, do you believe that it would have changed the outcome and should Congress look at mandating it? I can say something about that. Yeah, sure. yeah I mean, I strongly support transparency. You know, if you require, for example, that government uh, officials or people supported by the government, such as this EIP or VP group. And by the way, just to give you some quotes. Well, you mean what the ranking member described as legitimate uh, you know, suggestions and it was independent. Right. Isn't that always the defense, though, is that we didn't make the decision and the other guy didn't make the decision, it just happened. Right. I I'm down to just a few seconds, and I do want to thank our Canadian for uh, pointing out that we are about one step away from defunding here in the United States bank accounts. This administration has returned, so you understand, in the United States to making sure that people selling products or involved in activities that they don't want fail to have access. And that is another form of censorship that, I'm sorry it's gone so far in Canada, but trust me, it's underway in this country. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and, and I thank both of you. Sorry to cut you off, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Troy, I want to thank you for your powerful statement and for your courage. And I understand why my friend from California wants to tell us that this hearing isn't about Donald Trump, because that's too difficult a topic. Isn't Jerry, it? Jerry, as my friend, uh, I did Mr. want to thank Mr. you Chairman, for bringing Mr. The Chairman, Mr. Time, Mr. Chairman, it's my time. I reclaim my time. Virginia. Imagine it's October 2020, and someone tells you that President Donald Trump is going to use violence and chaos directed at the Congress and the Vice President of the United States to overturn the legitimate results 
of the 2020 presidential election. For many, that would have been hard to believe, and I'm sure my friends on the other side would have said, there they go again. Critics of Trump will just claim anything. But everyone here saw what happened on January 6th, and we now have, in fact, a federal indictment charging him with that very matter. This month, we learned that Donald Trump's shadow administration at Project 2025 is planning executive orders that would invoke the Insurrection Act and allow him to send military out to patrol American streets. Ms. Troy, some of my colleagues across the aisle have suggested that Trump's quotes about using military in our cities and the rumored plans to invoke the Insurrection Act are simply bluster designed to galvanize his base. Would you dismiss Trump's plans to deploy the military against American citizens as bluster? Thank you for the question. Absolutely not. Having worked in the Trump administration when President Trump at the time repeatedly raised the Insurrection Act as a potential um, to be used on protesters, even safe protesters, uh, repeatedly. And I can tell you that there were some serious heated discussions with members of his own cabinet, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Staff, heads of law enforcement, who expressed significant concern about the things being discussed to be used against our own American citizens. Yeah. That is something that should be taken very, very seriously. On June 1, 2020, uh, uh, on June 1, Americans watched as the National Guard participated in a violent crackdown near the White House. That's what you're referring to, is that not right? Correct. And there was a heated debate, and the president was the one asking that Federal troops, military, U.S. military, be called up to 10,000 troops to quell peaceful protests in Washington, D.C. Is that accurate? That is correct. I was there that day. And it was the president arguing to use the military. That is correct. And presumably, General Milley at the time resisted those calls. Is that correct? That is correct, and so did Secretary Esper. And that might have something to do with President Trump referring to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mr. General Milley, his chairman, as a traitor, and, and invoking the fact that the, the, in the old days, the price to be paid for convicted treason is death. Is that correct? That is correct. Chairman Milley was just doing his job in military service. Do you believe that the deployment of 10,000 troops at that time would have been consistent uh, with the mission of the American military, suppressing peaceful demonstrations by fellow Americans in the nation's capital? President Trump was told repeatedly that that would not be an appropriate use of the military resources, and he was also told that his efforts to uh, resituate law enforcement and use law enforcement agencies that were not appropriate for crowd control were also incorrect uses of what our law enforcement and these entities are, be, are, are traditionally used for. In your testimony, you cited <clears throat> uh, violent language, increasingly incendiary language being invoked by President Trump about his so-called enemies. One of the words he used was vermin. What does that echo in your mind? Anyone else come to mind historically who referred to enemies of the state as vermin? Yes, the horrible Hitler. And Goebbels. Thank you. Thank you so much for your courage. Thank you for being here. And I hope the American people take heed from your strong words today about the threat that's looming. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Troy, you said, stated in your opening statement that this committee was indulging in fantasy detached from reality, that members of this committee and their witnesses make grand and vague accusations about government censorship and that we are spreading conspiracy theories about government censorship. Would one of those conspiracy theories be that government-funded agencies were flagging and trying to censor official congressional accounts on social media? Are you denying that that occurred? I would have no knowledge of that. I'm not aware of that happening. Well, we're going to make you aware of that right now. Mr. Schellenberger. Uh, can can you speak to this tweet? I saw that you flagged this in one of your recent uh, articles on Substack. Can you, can you tell us uh, why this tweet 
brought attention in your article. Yeah, because that was one of the tweets that, uh, uh, that the Virality Project at, at Stanford Institute Internet Observatory had flagged to Twitter um, as misinformation and that uh, I believe it was labeled or censored in some other way. So it was uh, the Stanford Virality Project, that is funded by the, the government, is it not? Yes, it is. And so their purpose, ostensibly, is to stop misinformation, malinformation, and uh, to flag things they say that might be against the terms of service of the uh, social media companies, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Ms. Troy, is, is there any reason you think that this should have been flagged? For Depends removal? on whether you're spreading inaccurate information. Well, it references a study you from Israel, a published study from Israel, and the, and the tweet just restates the title of the study. Does it's it trouble the you that companies to review their policies? It's an uh, internal choice. Yeah, are you going to are you going to sit here and maintain that it's a conspiracy theory that this occurred? We have the documents. Mr. Schellenberger has the documents that showed that this occurred. Well, then it was flagged for a reason. What's the reason? Is there ever a good reason to censor a member of Congress? This is my official account. This is not a personal account. This is not a campaign account. This is my communication with my constituents. By the way, I bring this up not to, not to claim that members of Congress have more right to free speech than the general public. In fact, I don't even think the press or the media should, has more rights to the First Amendment than the general public. The general public has the same rights that we have. And I bring this up to show, number one, that your testimony is false. But number two, if they can do this to a member of Congress's official account, they can do it to anybody. Mm -hmm. Now I wanna move on to the origins of these programs. Mr. Schellenberger, can you tell us about the Cyber Threat Intelligence League? Was this a, just a group of uh, vigilantes, uh, concerned citizens, or was it in any way connected to the government? And what did they, what did they endeavor to do? Yeah, this was, uh, so first of all, it's a, it's a pretty ludicrous uh, founding, which was that this is a group of, it was Israeli, uh, for, so-called former Israeli intelligence, uh, former British intelligence, also working at Microsoft, and others who, who basically said, we're gonna volunteer our services. These are some of the world's greatest so-called cybersecurity professionals volunteering their services to multi-billion dollar hospital and healthcare organizations whose own IT organizations spend millions of dollars a year on cybersecurity supposedly volunteering this. This was the premise of the whole thing. It then created this third part that I mentioned. They had physical security, cybersecurity, they added cognitive security, and the people that did that were two UK and US military contractors. This, is, this was one of the most sophisticated mis you know, disinformation operations that I've ever seen. I've been involved in progressive causes for over 30 years. I've never seen uh, anything so organized, anything that was so, uh, so focused on a particular goal and it had so many people that came from military and intelligence organizations. It gave me the creeps just reading about it. And, and in the documents, is it true that they used their agency seals, FBI, CISA, uh, when they were communicating with each other? That's right, and, we, and, there's, and the whistleblower provided uh, screenshots of Slack conversations that included officials from DHS, Facebook, and the CTIL League. So it would be hard for somebody to claim that these folks weren't agents of the government or acting in coordination with the government or using things that they learned in their government. Were, they still were some of them still employed by the U.S. government when they were undertaking this? Yes, uh, Pablo Brewer was working for the U.S. Navy at the time, and the others were many of the others were claiming to be volunteering their time even while working their day jobs for the government. I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Massachusetts, recognized for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there's a term in behavioral science uh, called the weaponization of incompetence. That is, uh, it refers to the tactic of employing deliberate or feigned ineptitude or stupidity in order to avoid an unwanted task or responsibility. And, and I dare say that is what the Republican leadership is involved in this committee. Uh, this is the last, the last hearing, even though this committee was, this subcommittee was launched with great fanfare, uh, we have not had a hearing in this, this subcommittee, this select subcommittee since July, since July. 
And not only has so much time passed, but at today's hearing, we bring back the same two witnesses that we heard uh, back in July. Uh, actually, uh, Mr. Schellenberger mentioned nine months ago that he had been here. Uh, and, and so I'm just, I'm just cognizant of the fact that there, this is an investigation of the federal government, right? The federal government. That's who we're supposed to be investigating. We have 4.3 million federal employees. We have 2 million retirees, all of whom would be available to come here and testify about their experience for these allegations of weaponization of the federal government. And yet we bring back the same two witnesses we had uh, many months ago, and we bring back, uh, by her own description, a time traveler from Canada. I, I love Canada, by the way. Uh, and this, if this was a hearing on the Canadian government, I would, <clears throat> I would have Canadians lined up out in the hallway ready to testify. But uh, the, only, the only witness here that actually experienced in, in the federal government and could testify to that is, is Ms. Troy, and I'm very thankful for her, her testimony. You know, I'm old enough to remember Republicans who knew what they were doing, and I miss them. I miss them. I'm old enough to remember a, a, a Republican president who stood up, stood up to Russian dictators, not suck up to Russian dictators. American presidents, Republicans who, who told Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall, stood up for democracy, defended our democratic allies in Europe, didn't look for excuses that, well, the money's not in the budget, so we can't, we can't defend Europe. And that's what I, I see here today. Ms. Troy, the, the effect of incompetence in government at extreme levels, is that not itself a, a threat to national security? Yes, it absolutely is. So in, in our government, we recently spent 22 days without a Speaker of the House due to infighting, and, and we went through multiple candidates. It was, it was like an episode of one of those reality shows. We had another candidate, another candidate, and the only reason the, the recent Speaker got elected is because he had the, 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 the distinct quality that no one really knew him, and so he was chosen as, as our next Speaker. And the litmus test was whether or not the next speaker was subservient enough and adherent enough to the former president uh, who runs the Republican Party out of Mar-a-Lago. But that's not all. In June, the House Republican leadership brought us to the verge of a catastrophic default on our national debt, one that leading economists warned would be a first in American history and undermine the full faith and credit of the United States government and lead to a global economic meltdown. So now we're, we're facing a war in Europe, a war in the Middle East. We're facing a looming shutdown again of the United States government. And we're dealing with the weaponization of the deep state, which seems pretty shallow at, at this point with the, the paucity of, of witnesses that the Republican majority has, has produced. I hope at some point we get back to the business that, that America here, that sent us here to do. Uh, this is not it. Uh, this, is, this is crazy conspiracy uh, theory that we're pursuing here, and we ought to get back to the business uh, that America demands us uh, by virtue of our oath of office. And I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been almost one year since the first bombshell Twitter files. Looking back now, and my questions are for Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberger, what was the most alarming thing that you came across during your review of internal Twitter documents? And I have a number of follow-up questions, so keep it short. Sure, um, thank you for the question. Um, 
I think the most alarming thing that we, we saw was the regular stream, uh, organized stream of communication between uh, the FBI, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and the largest tech companies in the country. Uh, they had an organized system for flagging content, uh, not occasionally, but in enormous numbers uh, involving spreadsheets of accounts that ran to the hundreds and thousands. Um, and this was shocking to us and uh, to the congressman's point. This isn't crazy conspiracy theory. We've already had four federal judges uh, rule that they believe this, violate, this activity violates the First Amendment. Uh, this is quite serious. We didn't know whether it was against the law, but we certainly thought it was shocking uh, enough to be in the public interest. And that, that for me, was the most serious thing. Yeah, for me, it was seeing the uh, so-called former FBI officials within Twitter uh, and working with a variety, and other groups, including this Aspen Institute, participating in an effort to so-called pre-bunk the Hunter Biden laptop before it was ever published in the New York Post, and then to get it censored uh, by Twitter in violation of Twitter's own terms of service, whose internal staff had concluded that the New York Post tweet had not violated their terms of service and they censored it anyway. Mr. Schellenberg, I want to ask you further that revolving door between the FBI and Twitter, and I also want to ask about those third party, essentially government proxies. You referenced the Aspen Institute. Can you delve deeper into both of those questions, both of those topics? Sure, it was the former general counsel of the FBI, Jim Baker, and the former uh, deputy director of the FBI had both taken jobs at Twitter. There were so many FBI people uh, at uh, Twitter that they had their own internal group um, and their own little uh, crib sheet to describe the, the difference between the terms that they use at the FBI versus at Twitter. CIA um, had it as well. Yeah, CIA as well had their own little internal group. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the, the second question? The third party proxies. Oh yeah, the well Aspen then the Aspen Institute, this was the weirdest thing. We discovered that Aspen Institute had created a workshop that it was attended by basically all of the major media, including as well as all the major social media platforms to basically pre-bunk in advance the Hunter Biden laptop, even though it had not been, there was no evidence that, 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 it, that, that it existed outside of the fact that the FBI knew that it, they had it because they got it in December 2019. So to have the Aspen Institute trying to persuade people not to cover the Hunter Biden laptop story in August and September of, of uh, 2020 was quite uh, chilling and disturbing to see. Um, these content moderators at social media platforms like Twitter wield an enormous amount of power in terms of determining not only what Americans can say, but also what Americans can see. Do you believe, Mr. Taibbi and Mr. Schellenberg, that it's appropriate for unelected bureaucrats or these tech companies to collude to influence what Americans can say or read? Absolutely not. And, you know, I wanted to stress again that all this was happening secretively with the blessing of the Department of Homeland Security, with them sending uh, things to, uh, from, this is from the EIP at Stanford to, uh, you know, to, to Twitter and Facebook saying, we repeat our recommendations that this account be suspended. We recommend labeling all instances of this article. We recommend that you flag as false this. All these demands being made secretly without any, any public review. My view is that we don't, uh, the government doesn't decide who can speak in the, in the town square. Why should the government be deciding who can speak on social media platforms? We the people should decide our own content as adults, legal content, it should not be decided by either government or big tech. And Mr. Tyvee and Mr. Schellenberg, do you believe that this censorship is a form of election interference? I, absolutely it is, there's no question in my mind. Mr. Taibbi? Yes, I think it, it certainly can be. Um, we, in the, the latest story that we uh, did on the CTI League, uh, we saw the overt partisanship of the people involved in this uh, or, uh, operation. That was actually the reason the whistleblower came forward. Uh, the people involved, just assumed, the, one of the quote was, they assumed every, everyone who was smart thought the way they did. Um, they talked about the potential election of Donald Trump being an end of the world event. Um, they talk about the wackadoodles who actually watch Fox, Fox News. Um, and, you know, even as somebody who doesn't vote for Republicans, it was shocking to me to see this. And I think this was a consistent theme of, of uh, not just the CTI League, but most of the censorship organizations that we looked at. They all tend to drift in one direction. Yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
All of us here today have heard the stories of the depths of human depravity from the Hamas attack, resulting in unthinkable brutality, including the mass murder of innocent Jews and civilians on October 7th. Witnessing such barbarity steals part of your humanity, and it demonstrates how hatred can drive humans to do unspeakable things to one another. And nowhere is hatred more evident than on social media. Since the October 7th attack, anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim hate speech has exploded online. In just one month after the attack, the hashtag Hitler was right appeared in over 46,000 posts. But the rhetoric isn't limited to hate speech and death threats. Jewish conspiracy theories and disinformation continually find safe harbor on social media platforms. Even the racist and anti-Semitic great replacement theory was recently amplified on Twitter slash X by none other than its owner, Elon Musk, and the right-wing darling, Tucker Carlson. Terrorists used the platforms to terrorize target populations, and Hamas even used the personal accounts of hostages and victims to live stream their brutality to incite further violence. Mr. Taibbi, yes or no, should social media companies allow rape and murder to be live streamed by terrorists on their platforms in order to create fear and incite violence? I believe that would violate their terms of service, would it so, not? So your answer is no, it, it should not do, they should not be allowed to do that. Live stream rape and murder? No, right. I, think that, I think that would count as speech that would be prohibited under their ter terms good, of service. Good, good. You do have absolutist policies, um, but... I do least, not have absolute... Least, I, do, I do not have... Please don't interrupt me. You have absolute... I've asked your question, you answered it. You do have absolutist policies, at least they have some limits, but I think a Homeland Security official... Um, with respect, if, if, if Congressman, a, if, all journalists me, operate under my time. limits. If a Homeland Security official echoed your opinion, you would call it censorship, but I'm glad that at least you acknowledge that rape and murder should not be allowed on social media platforms. Ms. Troy, I have the same question. Yes or no, should, should social media companies take down brutal images of rape and murder live streamed by Hamas or similar groups like ISIS? I, I agree with uh, Mr. No, Ms. Troy. Oh, Ms. Troy. Ms. Troy. That's you were looking at me. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I believe they should follow their internal policies, and they should absolutely not leave content up like that. And I can tell you, as someone who worked on the Christchurch shooting, where the where that terrorist live streamed the attack, which was hor horrifying, horrific. We did have conversations. We had official meetings with social media as an international community to discuss terrorist use of the internet and this violent rhetoric on there and what it would lead to potential, more potential violence. These conversations were done in conjunction with social media companies and it was up to them on their policies to make their decision on whether that met the threshold. And that's exactly the point. Can, can you talk about during your time at the Trump White House, did you experience situations where information shared on social media presented a national security concern? Yes, there were multiple times. I will also reference what happened at the El Paso Walmart shooting where there was reference to the Great Replacement. That manifesto was posted on social media. That social media platform did not cooperate, that did not remove it, and I want to remind people that my aunt was in that Walmart when that shooting happened. And shifting gears, I want to get, ask about actual weaponization of the federal government, not the bogus red herrings that my Republican colleagues want to chase today, as you referenced in your opening statement. In your time on Trump's National Security Council, how were NSC, NSC staffers treated if they pushed back on so-called deep state narratives? Well, a lot of the time they were fired. And what, given what you saw on Trump's fresh threats to literally weaponize the government to attack his critics, what would a potential second term look like? I think that uh, you would see uh, many experts across U.S. government and the Intelligence Committee purged. There is currently a plan, Project 2025, that talks about exactly that. And I think that you would see a lot of the expertise be replaced by loyalists. And as a result of that, you would see a lot of damage to programs across the U.S. government that I want to remind people that all Americans utilize and need. There would be loyalists in charge of disaster relief aid, like I've mentioned, who would be making those decisions. Thank you. So, so making sure that we have social media companies that are able to communicate with the federal government to ensure that we protect people's lives and national security interests is critical. Mr. Chairman, we know social media companies fail to adequately moderate content, and this consistent failure spreads hate and deadly information. Hate online jumps off the screen and results in real-world acts of violence. Instead of focusing on real-world dangers, Republicans pillory public officials and academics who call out the companies who profit from the harm that they help cause. Then somehow they twist it into a narrative where conservatives are the victims, even as Trump revives Nixon's enemies list, 
right in front of our eyes. It's time for Republicans to stop gaslighting Americans. And I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Gentlemen. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent motion. Gentlemen, recognize. <clears throat> uh, I'd, I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce a November 21, 2023 letter to Linda Yaccarino, CEO of X, and Elon Musk, owner of X, that uh, was signed by 25 members of Congress expressing grave concern surrounding X's failure to abide by its own policies governing the promotion of misinformation and hateful, violent, and terroristic propaganda videos, okay. and for using that to, uh, those videos for profit. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous consent. Gentlemen, Kentucky's recognized. As unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, an article entitled CTI, CTI L Files Number 1, U.S. and U.K. military contractors created sweeping plan for global censorship in 2018. New documents show by Michael Schellenberger, Alex Gutentag, and Matt Taibbi, November 28, 2023. Yeah, uh, without objection. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's just absolutely fascinating to me how the folks on the left side of this dais have, are calling these things conspiracy theories when just through the Missouri v. Biden case, you're, there is a treasure trove of actual evidence in a court proceeding, witness testimony, factual evidence that, that shows that all of this has been happening under the Biden administration and that there is true censorship from this White House into the American people. Mr. Schellenberger, I wanna start with you. On November 2nd, 2023, you posted an article on your Substack uh, entitled, FBI and DHS Directors Mislead Congress About Censorship. In the post, you detail Senator Paul's recent questioning of DS DHS Secretary Mayorkas and FBI Director Ray regarding their respective department's censorship activities. Notably, Secretary Mayorkas and Director Ray both testified that their agency personnel complied with the law and did not violate First Amendment rights by targeting constitutionally protected speech on social media platforms. Given what we have learned in recent months from the Missouri v. Biden case and your investigative reporting shining the light on the Cyber Threat Intelligence League, is it fair to say that Secretary Mayorkas and Director Ray lied to Congress when they told Senator Paul that their agency personnel did not target constitutionally protected speech? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that they misled Congress. Um, I'm, I can't be sure of their intention, but they're wrong that those agencies weren't involved in, uh, in demanding censorship by the social media platforms. And, and just briefly, like, how, how, how were they involved in censoring speech? Well, FBI, I don't want to read your whole article, just... Oh, sure. I mean, FBI agents were directly flagging content to Twitter saying, this appears to violate your terms of service. What about this? What about that? Same thing with... DHS staff, and then of course DHS created uh, the Election uh, Integrity Partnership, which then became the Virality Project, which was in the process of demand demanding mass censorship of Americans. And based on them reaching out, a lot of these social media companies then acted on that, like the Hunter Biden laptop, all these different activities, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And you have to remember the context is that this was at a time when the social media companies were being threatened to lose their ability to operate, which is the Section 230. One of the most dramatic instances, which is in the Facebook files, is where the White House is, saying, is demanding that Facebook censor content that they think could lead to people becoming hesitant to take the vaccine. Facebook responded and said that they were removing often true content of vaccine side effects. Your piece also notes that Director Ray acknowledged that the FBI has been forced to alter its coordination with social media companies to comply with the injunction issued by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Missouri v. Biden. Right. Would you agree that this is an acknowledgement that the FBI's prior censorship conduct does in fact violate the First Amendment rights of Americans? Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record Mr. Schellenberger's sub-stack sub post from November 2nd, 2023. Uh, unless Congress acts, will there be any consequences for these government officials who have actively supported censorship of certain viewpoints on social media? We all hope that the Supreme Court rules uh, against these kinds of activities consistent with its past precedents that you, the government cannot appoint somebody else to, to violate the law, and that, which is what was going on here. But I don't think we can rely on the Supreme Court. I do think Congress should establish through Section 230 reform uh, the requirement that we, the people, are allowed to moderate our own content by choosing our own filters. Um, and that it should not be up to uh, the big tech platforms. And if you don't want to have Section 230, then you can just be a publisher like Matt and I are, or the New York Times is. Well, and I've worked on Section 230 legislation. The chairman is, is working on that, and I think that's something that absolutely has to happen this Congress so that people get their freedom and their First Amendment rights back. 
Uh, it's clear to me that Congress must act and hold these government officials accountable. The censorship industrial complex, as uh, you put it, and Mr. Taibbi have dubbed it, is an existential threat to our First Amendment freedoms. Unless we come together to impose transparency and accountability measures to prevent the government from engaging in such behavior, this, uh, this activity will unfortunately continue. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the Chairman Jordan's Free Speech Protection Act that he sponsored in partnership with Senator Paul. This legislation is needed to ensure that government officials face significant consequences for engaging engaging in the censorship and suppression of speech protected by our Constitution. Further, we must enact transparency measures so that officials cannot hide behind public-private partnerships in order to skirt around their legal obligations. Sadly, we cannot trust many federal officials to adhere to their oath they took to uphold and defend the Constitution, and it's up to Congress to ensure our First Amendment rights are protected. In the remaining time I have, Mr. Tybee, if you could just comment uh, on what you weren't able to respond to from Mrs. Washerman Schultz. Yeah, so first of all, just for the record, I've said on many occasions that uh, I'm not a free speech absolutist. Uh, in, in fact, no journalist is or can be. We all operate under very uh, serious restrictions involving libel, defamation, incitement. Uh, we have to navigate each one of those rules every time we publish anything. Uh, and then we always look uh, fondly uh, on that process because we believe those rules protect us. Uh, so we're not free speech absolutists. We're just uh, in, not in favor of government censorship. Uh, that's the issue here. There's, there's, a, there's a profound difference between um, litigating something like libel or defamation and having a, an unelected, unaccountable, um, uh, in, unseen uh, committee uh, remove your content without any due process. That, that's what we're talking about. Time of the I yield back. Thank you for being here. Uh, the time of the gentleman's fire, uh, gentleman yields back. Gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here. And, and uh, Mr. I just want to start with saying congratulations. I know today is your anniversary. What a, what a way to kick off your 10th, 10th year uh, anniversary. Uh, and let me just say that um, as a fellow Texan, I certainly recognize and uh, respect and admire the courage that you have shown uh, in appearing here today and also making other statements and speaking up about some of the issues that we will talk about today. Before coming to Congress many, many years ago, I was a judge in Houston, in Texas. I oversaw courtrooms as the presiding judge, so I understand well the need for privacy uh, to make the justice system work. Everyone here has heard of witness protection. We know the bad guys want to scare and intimidate the opposition. You've talked about a bad guy today. Uh, and I think you've said that uh, in one interview that I saw you, you um, did that uh, former President Trump would never saw a line he wouldn't cross. You also said that he was about uh, bullying, retribution, attacking, humiliating, badgering his, any opposition. So we all understand the importance of safeguarding sensitive information, and that's why I'm appalled at the number of people that are being doxxed. For those who don't know what dox mean, it simply means that someone takes sensitive personal identifying information from court cases or private documents, and they blast it out to the world without the person's permission. This harmful practice often targets people who are outspoken politically, and the information is being published by political opponents, like biased news outlets, with slanted views or individual bad actors hiding safety behind their own anonymous <coughs> keyboards. Ms. Troy, have you ever been targeted by trolls on the internet? And if so, are you willing to share how that experience has impacted you and your family? Yes, I am the subject of trolling consistently, um, and it has been intimidating at times. At times, my family has had to leave our home. Um, and it has been um, stressful and unnerving. I am very much in touch with law enforcement locally at times when these incidents had happened, and I have personally actually been doxxed by a member of uh, President Trump's uh, cabinet, an acting member of his cabinet, when he filed a lawsuit against me, and instead of redacting uh, my home address, he published it, and Breitbart circulate, circulated it. It was circulated on social media. Uh, fortunately, I was actually not living on that, at that address at the time, but I will tell you that I felt very deeply for the family, the innocent family that was, 
where I had to send law enforcement uh, to their home and warn them that there could be potential danger to their family uh, because my address had been put out there thinking that that's where I lived. So has there been other personal information or, or sensitive information about you that has been put out there either about you, your husband, or any member of your family? Certainly um, information about my family has uh, been published, information about, believe it or not, my, my, my pets. I am a dog lover. I love, I love Ringo and Stevie. They're my two woodles. I love them more than anything. They're like our kids. My husband knows this. Um, certainly the pictures of them um, so at times have been returned to me with their heads beheaded. I don't know how you can actually do that to a, just an innocent animal, uh, but these are the kinds of things that I know myself and other colleagues um, have been on the receiving end of. So you've been targeted uh, mostly online, this bullying harassment, or have you also been harassed or We've had people, or anything yeah. in your home or when you're shopping? Um, I, I've certainly had the harassment out in public. I've certainly had people uh, sort of troll and case our house. Uh, we have a lot of security. I will tell you that I, uh, I um, have turned on social media monitoring for this hearing because I know uh, how this goes uh, when, when, this, um, when scenarios like this happen, and I know it's happened to others who have testified um, in situations. I know that it happened to colleagues of mine during the, the first Trump impeachment on Ukraine. I lived that firsthand internally in the White House. I know what they were subjected to. So this has a chilling effect on free speech, and more importantly, it makes people <coughs> hesitate to speak up and come and testify and tell us what they know and what they witnessed. I can guarantee you I've had so many conversations with people in national security, former members of Trump's own cabinet who do not want to speak out uh, publicly, even though they have the same concerns that I do. Um, and I think that there would be plenty of people in government service who could sit here and uh, refute some of the claims and attacks against them. But it, it comes at great personal cost. It comes at great cost to your finances. It comes at great cost of your safety to your families. We've seen Republicans, Republican members of Congress that I had deep respect for not run for office again because they wanted to protect their families given what we've seen and the trends that have happened. That has been a great disappointment to someone like me who looked up to these people. Right, they'll just become targets and face retribution and attacks in social media. Uh, so I understand it. I know for me, even, um, we did a weaponization hearing in the morning, and by the end of the day, I had a death threat. Uh, I, in fact, talked about it with the federal courts in New Mexico yesterday. So it happens. You don't have free speech. The attacks are there. So thank you for coming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think my, um, is my time up? Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, I would like to enter this. You'd like to keep going? No, I'd like to enter it for the record. We, all, we, we would all like to do that. No, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record an article on the U.S. Supreme Court temporarily sure. blocks ordering Missouri social media lawsuit. Without objection. Ask for unanimous consent. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, Ms. Subramaya, I would, I would argue it's already here. You said in your, in your statement you want to give us a glimpse of what lies ahead. I, would, I, I think it's already here. In the course of our investigation uh, in this committee, on January 15, 2021, the FBI sent to Bank of America, tell us all customer, all your customers' purchases in the Washington, D.C. area for a specific date. Customers transacting debit card or credit card Washington, D.C. purchases on specific dates in this town. Anyone, whether you're here, whether you're here for the rally, whether you're here for any kind of protest, what, if you're just in visiting your mom. And they further said, and any, and they capitalize any, any historic purchase going back six months for any weapons or rep weapons related vendor purchases. That is frightening stuff. Because you, you gave the example, I think D uh, Danny Bulford, you gave the example. Uh, I think it's already here. Um, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I'm working on issues uh, related to that here in the U.S. Uh, there are people who have been debanked de in America. Uh, they generally tend to be on the conservative side. Uh, they're t uh, I've, I've interviewed uh, pastors, um, missionaries who, who do good work overseas. Uh, they've been debanked uh, um, for no, with, with no explanation. Uh, you know, the reasons are very vague, that your risk profile doesn't match 
what we can, what we're comfortable with. And, and so these are people who've been debanked for doing good work and they generally tend to be on one side of the political spectrum. But by the way, was, uh, I think in your testimony you said this guy, uh, Mr. Bulford, was uh, former Royal Canadian Mountain Police, was not charged with anything, wasn't being held, was released, and that's when the debanking took place. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, uh, roughly. They, they were all happening around the same time. But he, he wasn't charged with anything, and no, yet he couldn't get access nothing. to his account. So the, the, the Trudeau government invoked the Emergencies Act. It's only been invoked twice um, during the two wo world wars. And uh, one, one of the outcomes of the Emergency Act was to go after people who were peacefully protesting against the COVID-19 vac vaccine requirements. And if you donated to, to the cause, you found yourself yeah. debanked. And this is what ended up happening with 280 people. Mr. Tybee, is, is there a realignment happening? I mean, I, I look at today's panel. The Democrats invited a individual who worked in a Republican administration, and Republicans invite two former Democrats, award-winning journalists. One was the hero of the environment, as recognized by Time magazine. The other one worked for Rolling Stone. And we invite a foreigner to come tell us, hey, don't let this stuff happen here. If America goes this way, the whole world's in even bigger trouble. I mean, is, it seems to me there's a realignment happening, and I think I've invited more Democrat witnesses to testify in front of this committee than the Democrats have, because <laughs> the focus is on the First Amendment. And I don't care whether you're Republican, Democrat, independent, conservative, progressive. What I care about is the ability to speak, and to speak in a political fashion, and not have the government come after you for doing so. So I think there is a total realignment happening in, in the culture and in the politics, and frankly, I think that's a darn good thing. Not, not what they're doing, but the realignment. Well, uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that there's uh, a realignment going on. Um, until very recently, I think free speech uh, and free speech culture was um, uncontroversially embraced really by both parties. Uh, you know, during the entire uh, early period of the war on terror, uh, those issues strongly animated most Democrats that I knew. Uh, most of my friends were um, in opposition to laws like the Patriot Act, or at least concerned about them, uh, the potential for overreach there. Um, and, you know, the, the, most people understood, for instance, uh, the work of the ACLU um, in defending cases like the Skokie uh, March. And to the point about hate speech that was brought up before, I think it's important to point out that the, the reason that they defended um, those marchers is not because they liked hate speech or they, they, they liked Nazis. Right. Um, it, it's because it, this, the American tradition uh, understands that the moment you grant uh, a government official the right to, to prohibit one kind of speech, you're going to have a whole series of people. Yep. Uh, th those people are all civil rights activists. They were afraid that the next thing that would happen would be uh, you know, southern officials banning NAACP marches. Um, that used to be sort of universally understood yep. in America, and for some reason that, uh, in the last uh, decade or so, there's been um, a, a complete change in how we look at those issues. Yeah, I just want to do one last thing in the, in the remaining few seconds I got. Let's, let's put this on the screen, because I think this is interesting, too. It tells you how upside down things have become. Uh, we have testifying in front of us today Ms. Subramanya, who is from Canada, telling us, look, get ready, because we've seen what's happened in, in our country, and we don't want it happening here. This is a recap of a phone call from one of the executives at Facebook with folks from the White House. And the person recapping this just happens to be the former UK minister in the, in the member of parliament, uh, Nick Clegg. And he says this, I countered that removing the content like the White House wanted them to do would represent a significant incursion in traditional boundaries of free expression in the United States. So we got a Canadian warning us, we got a member of parliament, where I think it's interesting, the, the irony here, that someone from you know, Great Britain is telling us about what our rights are. I mean. You know, we, we had a little you know, skirmish way back in 1776 about this very kind of thing. I mean, this is how upside down it has gotten. Three, I don't know Ms. Subramanian's politics, but two former Democrats, three journalists, and they invite a Republican. It just tells you what is going on. But I think, again, underscoring how important this is. And it's not crazy. It's not bogus. It's not unfounded, as the Democrats have said. And the Fifth, Fifth Circuit has certainly said it's not those three things. I'm over time, but... Now yield to, uh, I'll now yield to uh, Mr. Allred. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time to the ranking member, Ms. Plaskett. 
Thank you to my colleague for yielding the time. Um, just first, let's get correct. Ms. Troy is the first Republican that we have called as a witness. And unfortunately, we get one and you get three. That's the um, unfortunate part of being in the minority. So you probably have invited more Democrats than we have, but she's the first Republican. And I would remind you, Mr. Chairman, uh, if you didn't know that that gentleman on the wall over there, Lamar Smith, the good man from Texas was my first boss here when I was a staffer on the Hill. Uh, I also worked for Rob Portman when he was a member of the House and worked in the Bush administration. I've stayed where I am. People ask me, why are you a Democrat? I thought you were registered Republican, and I was. And I looked around and the Republican Party had moved and shifted to the right, and I was exactly still where I was. Uh, and so realized that I could not be a part of that party anymore. But in asking some of these questions, uh, you know, one of the things that you brought up, Ms. Troy, that I thought was very interesting is the discussion of these loyalty tests. And we have heard the president say that he's going to do this again. And I, I bring this up because the loyalty test is about his use of the federal government to exact revenge on individuals. Trump has said that he is going to weaponize his next administration, but in order to do that, he must have individuals who will do what he asked them to do outside of their, um, of their duties in whichever specific position that is. And, you know, I know that in the last administration, we've learned that the president was obsessed with loyalty from his staff. We all want loyalty. We all want people who are going to give us uh, their loyalty. But some of us think of loyalty as in a different way. I think of loyalty from my staff as telling me when I'm messing up, telling me when something is wrong, because they don't want me to do the wrong thing. That is loyalty. But President Trump has a different sense of loyalty. His aide, Johnny McEnty, even conducted loyalty tests, including one-on-one -on -one interviews with political appointees across different agencies. Of course, I had been an, an appointee in a Republican administration, Democratic administrations. They have interviews with you to see where your ideology is, but it is not necessarily to see if you are going to give blind allegiance to the president. In this one, it says that uh, these t interviews were to root out threats of leaks and other potential subversive acts. If he wins again, Trump has pledged to overhaul agencies uh, and expand this loyalty test to not just political appointees, but non-political career employees who have spent decades building their knowledge and expertise and possess invaluable experience that brings continuity to our government across different administrations. I know when I worked at the Department of Justice, it was important in each one of the divisions to have one person who was a career person to sit in all of the discussions to ensure that there is continuity of government. There are vital public assertions. This notion of throwing our systems and career officials like national security officials out the window based on political ideology should be troubling to us all. Ms. Troy, are you familiar with the loyalty tests, and can you explain their purpose within the Trump administration? I am. I'm, I'm very familiar with the loyalty test. It certainly was being enacted towards the end of the Trump administration, uh, where they were staffing people who, I would say, did not have the credentials traditionally into very senior roles in the National Security Council. For example, in the Directorate of Resilience, which I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks where I said that it could impact disaster relief aid, I want to be very clear about that on how dangerous it is because this person was potentially going to be in charge that had no background in it, did not understand how the interagency works on this, did not understand FEMA, did not understand HUD, did not understand what it takes to push this through the process. And I will say that should loyalists be placed in positions like this going forward, um, the loyalty test being that you will not abide by the rule of law, that you will bend the rules, you will not follow the regulations and procedures. I think that we are heading down a further dark path that will affect all of us. Doesn't matter, different Democrats or Republicans. I know that in the Trump administration, for example, there was a fire management assistance grants for California during the horrific 
2018 wildfire season where Trump did not want to issue the aid. In fact, I believe he told Brock Long, who was the head of FEMA at the time, don't give them a dime because they were a blue state. I can tell you that it was only until Donald Trump was shown that Orange County voted in his favor majorly that he finally released that aid. That, that should not play a role in how we respond to American citizens when they are in need, especially in things like disasters. So when I look at Florida and I see Ron DeSantis, who is an opponent to Trump, I think about those people in Florida, primarily Republicans, who are always in the path of hurricanes at times, and I think about what it's gonna look like for them when aid is not received should Trump get back into office. Thank, thank you very much, I yield back. Generally yields back, the chair now recognizes the gentleman. And I, sh I should, if any of you need a break, just let us know, I should have mentioned that earlier. Um, uh, just, just let us know and we'll be happy to do that. Gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. There is a very odd, oppositional dynamic in this hearing, which uh, is striking. And Ms. Troy, I want to get at it by asking you this. You, you, you said something along the lines that the, the belief that there uh, has been social media censorship against conservatives is sort of a figment of conservatives' imagination. Ms. Uh, uh, Wasserman Schultz summarized it as a, as, a, as a red herring, bogus red herring. You're aware of the Missouri versus Biden district court decision that recited evidence that the White House, the FBI, CISA, all engaged in working through the social media companies to conduct censorship. It was preliminarily enjoined. You're aware that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has reviewed that, found that the findings of the district court were well supported by evidence and modified and substantially affirmed the preliminary injunction against the government entered by, are you aware of all that? And does it affect your view that all of this is a figment of imagination? I am aware of the decision. I also wanna clarify, I, I have not actually did never said that this is a conspiracy. You've not heard that comment from me. So you believe there's, there is censorship going on by means of the I federal will. government on the social media platforms, or has been? I can only speak to my experience, and I will say that I've sat in a lot of these interagency meetings with social media companies, and ultimately, it was their decision. And I will say that well, when it, content was removed, it was ultimately up to them. Yeah, yeah, we followed Yeah, the but process. see, that's, that's what the court has said is the problem, is that the, the agencies have engaged in this subterfuge where they say, well, we want you to make the decision, but they're all over them to the point that their constant involvement makes it government involvement. That's the threat. Mr. Schellenberger, let me turn to you, because uh, I was thinking about where we are. Twitter files revealed these connections, right? Direct connections between Elvis Chan of the FBI and social media companies, uh, CISA and the social media companies. And then your further reporting and yours, Mr. Taibbi, revealed the next layer, which is what you call the censorship industrial complex. The connection between CISA funding these adjacent agencies, Stanford, uh, people at Stanford, uh, people at University of Washington. And, and so you, they could offload this exact subterfuge and they could pre-bunk stuff and, and stop whole narratives from taking hold. And now your CTI league shows yet another dynamic in two ways, it seems. You've got this guy, we ought to get his name out there for, for folks, Pablo Brewer, you said, a, mil, a commander with the Special Operations Command, I believe, at some point, and he's involved in this CTI league, but they got Israeli, you mentioned British intelligence, Intelligence, and you say at this, in part of your report, the authors, and talking about one of their reports, advocated for police, military, and intelligence involvement in censorship across Five Eyes nations, and even suggested that Interpol should be involved. Why is that significant, Mr. Schellenberger? <laughs> oh, because I mean, it's not blind to me, obviously. <laughs> Do it as quickly as you can, because I've got one other thing I really want to get to if we can. Well, because, I mean, our, we, we don't want the police and the military to decide what we can say and, and read. And that's, our, that's what makes our country amazing, is that our founding fathers, they said, speech comes, it's the First Amendment, it comes before government. Where it's not, in, in Europe, the king would decide whether you could say things. We didn't want it that way. We said, we want to decide. Here's, here's what it tells me that's chilling. And Ms. Subramania, I'm minded of your presence here as a Canadian. So 
if they can't do it directly from the FBI, then they get institutions, academic, pseudo-academic institutions involved. If they find that that's going to be blunted because we can go take their funding away because there's U.S. agency funding, then they get the five eyes involved. If they can't stop it here in the United States, they can go get the European Union or the other governments to say, we're not, or, or Canada, to deem this stuff to be threatening. Uh, that, that's what, and the dynamic deepens and deepens. This is a big deal. And here we are, every person on the minority side has talked about Donald Trump. I would think, Ms. Troy and others, that if you're concerned, if you're genuinely concerned about Donald Trump as a threat, what we're talking about today should be all the more threatening to you because we're talking about setting precedents and diminishing the ability of Americans to express themselves. So, Ms. Subramanya, back to you. Republicans have been involved in this, by the way. The former Senate, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Mac Thornberry, helped to repeal the Smith-Munt Act. Nikki Haley said the other day that we ought not be able to allow to have anonymous Twitter accounts. What do, I, what do you make of this dynamic that I describe in that and what you're seeing in this hearing? That the party that has established, frankly, the liberals established fundamental principles of free speech through the Warren Court. They've been continued consistently by the Supreme Court, but now they're under threat by the other side who just wants to talk about Donald Trump. What is going on? Um, oh, boy. Um, um, so, look, I, I can't speak to what's happening here in, in America in terms of the internal political situation here. What I can point to is the fact that I come from a country where free expression, the right to express oneself freely, has been under threat. And it happened in a very short period of time. It just happened under 10 years. And, and it's happening all over the world now. It's happening in Ireland. Ireland is about to pass legislation um, which, is, which is among the most, it's one of the most draconian hate speech laws in the world. They're trying to stamp out hate. Um, how does one stamp out hate? It's part of the human condition. And, and, and this is extremely worrying. The government cannot define hate, but yet they have this legislation. Uh, it can even come down to, the, to, the, to, to, to a situation where you could have a meme on your phone and the Irish police would have the authority to come and arrest you even if you haven't shared that meme. This is where we're going. We're going, it's straight out of Minority Report, you know, where the precogs determine that you're about to be hateful and they come and arrest you. And this is happening in a Western liberal, liberal democracy. And so we have to look at the warning signs. We have to look at what's happening in Canada. We have to look at what's happening in Ireland and France and the EU. And you're absolutely right. You know, the governments will find ways to go about censoring people. Uh, you, you know, we know that's happening under the Biden administration where, you know, they got media companies like Facebook and Twitter to deplatform content on their sites, which, they, which, which the administration didn't like. But since it comes from a private platform, it doesn't violate the First, first Amendment at first glance. But if it was under duress from the federal government, then there are grounds to yeah. Thank believe you, that it violates the spirit of the First Amendment. My time's long expired. Mr. Chairman, you. Gentlemen, just back there. I mean, it is this... It's all frightening, but uh, the name, Cyber Threat Intelligence League, it's not like it's out of Marvel Comics, you know, it's like they, they give it this, this, this name, but it's like it's frightening what's going on. The gentleman from California is recognized. For uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sumarian? Subramania. Subramanian. Thank you. Uh, you just happened to provide the opening for my comments. Uh, indeed, we need to be very, very aware of the potential use of government to weapon, the weaponization of government against uh, individuals, against free speech, uh, against those who would oppose the government. Uh, and your concern is a very real concern. And America has a need to be concerned because we have a former president and a gentleman who wants to be president again, who is in the process of articulating and laying out his agenda for a new term as president. Donald Trump has been very, very clear how he intends to use the government to really achieve the things that you are fearful of happening. Uh, and 
it's very clear what he intends to do. He has said so publicly in his political rallies. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he reposted uh, on Truth Social, his network, calling for the New York Attorney General and uh, Supreme Court judge to be placed under citizen's arrest. Uh, these two individuals you remember are the prosecutor and the judge in his civil fraud case in New York. Clearly using, would use his power as, as president to attack the judicial system in America. He has since uh, gone on to attack both again on social media and threatened to indict any opponent he faces and take them out if he wins in 2024. Indeed, we do have reasons to be concerned about the future. Should this man become president? I think uh, one of my colleagues uh, on the majority side indicated that uh, we should look to the four years when Trump was president to what he did then as president. And uh, many of the things that uh, the witnesses are concerned about did in fact take place during his presidency. Uh, one example of a larger pattern of Mr. Trump's rhetoric is repeatedly and egregiously used his position of power to spread conspiracy theories, fan the flames of discord with inflammatory rhetoric and make threats of political prosecution. Words have power, particularly when they're used by someone who's so prominent in our news. Uh, certainly, all of you, including all of us, are concerned about the right to free speech. And I would be very interested to see what legislation comes forward as a result of these hearings, where we are basically repeating what we heard nine months ago. So what is the legislation that would address this? Mr. Schellenberg, you presented four different ideas. I'm not going to ask you to repeat those. They're in the record, and I'm curious to see if the majority will take them up or just, again, to flog this horse one more time. Uh, we've seen uh, the real consequences of uh, Mr. Trump's behavior. We saw it uh, after he repeatedly attacked the FBI for what he thought were their transgressions. And so what happened to career FBI agents? They are threatened, seriously threatened, in their homes, death threats. Uh, and of course, January 6th is well known, and we won't go into that in great detail. So, Mr. Troy, from your experience in the White House, has Donald Trump used his rhetoric as a weapon, weaponization of government? Absolutely, and some of the examples that I provided are examples of how the government was used against the people under Donald Trump. And honestly, when I heard uh, your opening statement, I felt like you were describing what I had lived for four years working in the U.S. government of the fears that I saw that were coming to fruition, almost word for word, to be honest. And I was thinking about it and what the future does hold should Trump come back into office because that is sort of the government that he wanted. It was to use the government to his favor, to attack his political enemies, and to silence any dissent when he fired heads of intelligence agencies just for telling the truth about potential foreign adversaries or things that happen where we're happening with our election or merely just for taking a stand on things that he wanted to do in foreign policy that would have put us into very dangerous predicaments. Thank you very much. My time having expired, yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the young lady from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, for the life of me, I cannot find anywhere in the public notices, in our meeting memos, in our congressional hearing documents, any mention of where this is a hearing about President Trump. I, it, it escapes me. I, I know that we have a literacy crisis in this country, and I am shocked that it has made its way to the halls of Congress. I think we should do something about that. Anyways, I speak for all Americans, I believe, when I say that it really shouldn't matter who's in office. It really shouldn't matter who is in the White House. Because regardless, we should all be concerned about our constitutional rights. We should all be here protecting our constitutional rights. And so I would encourage my Democratic colleagues that they maybe they should 
I don't know, focus on the evidence that has been presented here because it impacts all Americans, not just Republicans, but Democrats too. So I, I think that we could actually do something to address the weaponization of government in a bipartisan fashion because it has tremendous impacts on our everyday life. So I'm gonna just jump right into it. Ms. Troy, I appreciate you being here. My colleague, Mr. Bishop, touched on this, but I wanna just make sure that I am exceptionally clear. You said that, quote, the government is not taking social media posts down, end quote. This is from your opening statement. You said that the censorship of American people is, quote, the result of the social media companies exercising their First Amendment rights. You were part of Vice President uh, Pence's team, were you not? Yes, that is correct. And so as someone who is familiar with White House officials, you can confirm that the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Digital Strategy, Rob Flattery, and the White House Senior Advisor, Andrew Slavitt, are indeed government officials and not social media executives, correct? Yes, when they were serving in, their, in the White House, they are government officials. Okay, so on February 6, 2021, at 9.45 p.m., I just love when we have timestamps and all this in writing. It helps tremendously. When Mr. Flattery emailed Twitter executives demanding the immediate removal of accounts linked to Biden's adult daughter, he stated, please remove this account immediately. He also stated, quote, I have tried to use your form three times. It won't work. I think this is ridiculous that I need to upload my ID to prove that I am an authorized representative of the president. Two minutes later, at 9.47 p.m., Twitter executives responded saying, thanks for sending this over. We'll escalate for further review here. He shot back. I cannot stress the degree to which this needs to be resolved immediately. Those accounts were then suspended and taken down. Now, fast forward about a month, Mr. Slavit. Biden's White House senior advisor said in writing, you know, it would be nice to establish trust with Twitter executives. Internally, we have been considering what our options are on what to do about non-compliance. Is that a threat? Would you consider that a threat from Biden White House officials to social media company executives to censor Americans' First Amendment rights? I think you would have to ask that question to them. I can't speak for what was intended by that message. If you were in that position, what would you do? Well... Actually, I can tell you because I've had conversations with social media companies during the Trump administration while on Mike Pence's office where I did call a social media company and we did uh, say, could you please take these photos down if possible because a U.S. missionary was killed brutally in Cameroon yeah. and Charles Wesco from Indiana whose brother serves as a Republican in the end, Indiana state legislature, it was his brother who was killed brutally. And the ambassador from Cameroon, US ambassador, did weigh in and say, can we take these down while they circulate to notify the next of, next of kin before they see these horrific images of their father brutally murdered in a crossfire between two different opposing groups in Cameroon. Absolutely, Ms. Troy, that is, that is heartbreaking. Them. And we hold on, I've got to reclaim my images. time here. But so Ms. Troy, what answer? I'm saying is, Can I, I just present, answer? no ma'am, I presented you with a parody account that the White House had to take down, a parody. That is a very different situation than graphic photos of a tragedy. Would I you am, agree? I am speaking That's a simple yes or no. A situation where Ms. Troy, if you, cannot, if you cannot distinguish between a parody account and memes and jokes versus graphic photos, that's a problem. I can't speak to what they were referencing. I don't know. I just laid it out for you, but I, I'll reclaim my time. I'm going to switch to you, Mr. Schellenberger and Mr. Taibbi. Thank you guys for appearing here before. In a very short order, I have to go... Uh, up here before the CDC director, Dr. Cohen, please talk about the treasure trove of evidence that you have found with regard to the CDC silencing world-renowned epidemiologists such as Dr. J. Bhattacharya and the impact that that has had on public health and the health of various Americans around the country because of the work of the CDC and FDA silencing these voices. Time of the gentlewoman has expired, but that the witnesses can respond and answer Thank the you. question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, uh, during a crisis, you need free speech so you can respond, you can have these issues, you can debate them. And what we saw was both Harvard epidemiologist uh, Martin Kildoff um, and Stanford epidemiologist Jay Bhattacharya were both censored. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya was put on a trends blacklist. The things that they were advocating was mainstream epidemiology. 
um, and their voices were stifled, and we now have seen the consequences of it, most particularly this horrendous learning loss among children that could have been avoided if we had adopted uh, what Dr. Bhattacharya was recommending. Mr. Tabi, go ahead. Just quickly, if I could, yeah, the, sure. the, the trans blacklist uh, image that we saw with Dr. Bhattacharya, that was one of the very first things that we found uh, in the Twitter files. And it was a, uh, an early example of what, um, what we came to understand as malinformation. Uh, it's the idea of something that's not untrue or it is true, but uh, is believed to produce an undesirable uh, political result. Um, this is extremely dangerous. Dr. Bhattacharya has had a legitimate scientific opinion. He turned out to be correct. Uh, his study was later ra uh, ratified by the WHO. Um, and, but it, it was considered to be um, against the policies of the current government. And so he became one of the most suppressed people in the country during 2020 and 21, which is exactly what the First Amendment was designed to prevent. I would just point out before rec uh, recognizing Mr. Goldman uh, that we will take you up on what you said, Ms. Troy. Ms. Kamek asked you a question and, and about Mr. Slavitt and Mr. Uh, Flaherty, and you said we should ask them, and we're going to. That's why we sent them a subpoena this morning. We want them to come in and answer these questions about why the White House was attempting to censor American speech. With that, I recognize the gentleman from New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My colleagues and friends from North Carolina and Florida are asking why we are talking about Donald Trump. The answer is because this subcommittee is called the Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. And because of that, <clears throat> we actually, the only evidence that we have here in front of us today about the weaponization of the Federal Government is from Ms. Troy, who has outlined in detail, and I'm sure she has more detail, how Donald Trump weaponized the federal government against his enemies and for his own political interests and how he intends to do it again. So if we really want to talk about the weaponization of the federal government, we should talk about it, and that's Donald Trump. That's not this grand, crazy conspiracy of how the uh, administration has utilize the social media companies against whom the First Amendment does not apply in order to suppress speech. We, this is actually the second hearing, I guess our quarterly hearing now, on the, the Twitter files with the same uh, witnesses that we had. In the first hearing, um, I asked uh, Chairman Jordan uh, if he could identify any evidence of the government um, under the Biden administration actually censoring. Um, uh, anyone through the social media companies. He pointed out to me an email um, on January 22nd uh, from Clark Humphrey to flag a tweet that was from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as evidence. The problem was, and the chairman did not, rec did not acknowledge this, the tweet was never taken down. How can you have censorship if the tweet was not taken down? And since March 9th, that hearing, this committee has had 29 witnesses. Were the gentleman you? Uh, I, I will not only just because I have a bunch. You, if you, you're the chairman, so I'm sure you'll respond after me. Um, the 29 witnesses have testified, and every single one testified, that the government never coerced, pressured, or threatened any social media company to remove any content. Mr. Taibbi, I introduced a letter um, that I led to X. Um, let's call it X now. That way we can know the difference between when Elon Musk took it over and before uh, when it was Twitter. Um, from November 21st, have you read this? No. Well, <clears throat> do you think it would be problematic if X leaves up terrorist violence and propaganda in violation of the terms of service? Terrorist violence or terrorist prop propaganda? If it violates their terms of service, is it, is it problematic? Well, it depends on what the content is, but um, you know, they're a private company. They can do what they want with the content. Aha! They're a private company, and they can do what they want with the content. Do you think it's problematic that X would profit off of terrorist violent, violence uh, propaganda and content on their social media? platform? Well, first of all, just to go back to no, the... No, no, just answer the question. I don't have time. Do you think it's a pro problem if, they're, if they profit off of it? Well, 
if, they, if the company makes money doing what it does, I don't, I don't necessarily see a problem with that. Okay, interesting. Um, so let me just move on because you the, said the, the, the biggest concern, the between, sir, I'm sorry, you said the biggest concern that you had from the Twitter files was the systematic flags for social media companies. Now, the Stanford EIP that you're talking about, I'm sure you are aware, uh, has documented that the social media platforms to whom they flagged potentially problematic tweets took action on only 35% of them, and only 13% of them were removed. Mr. Schellenberger, you said the biggest problem, and, and let me just ask you, Mr. Tybee, real briefly, you would agree that these flags, that the systematic flags that you saw were flags for a violation of the terms of service of the social media company, is that right? Sometimes, but sometimes in the case of uh, the instances like Congressman Massey, they were actually true information. Uh, I under, well, that, that may be the case, but the flag was for a violation of the terms of service. It's for their interpretation of a, of a violation. The, and then the social media company has to determine whether or not it, was, it is actually a violation of their terms of service. And in 87% of those flags, they were not removed. Mr. Schellenberger, in brief time, you, only, you said that the censorship, the biggest problem you have is the censorship that you talk about is election interference. Yeah. Do you agree that Russia used social media, including Twitter, to interfere in the 2016 presidential election? Yes. Thank you. Now, we've also briefly, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just have the extra time that my colleagues have had, um, you've talked about the Hunter Biden laptop and how the FBI knew it existed. You are aware, of course, that the uh, laptop, so to speak, was actually, that was published in the New York Post, was actually a hard drive that the New York Post admitted here was not authenticated as real. It was not the laptop the FBI had. You're aware of that, right? It was the same contents. How do you know? Because... It, <laughs> Because it's the same, I mean, it's You would have to authenticate it to know it was the same contents. contents. You have no idea. You know you hard drives can that be it's a conspiracy? manipulated. Are you suggesting the New York Post participated in a conspiracy to construct the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop? <laughs> no, sir. The problem is that hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani or Russia. Well, what's the evidence that that happened? That, what's well, the there is actual evidence of it, but the point is it's There's not no the evidence same thing. So you're engaging in a conspiracy I'm glad theory. you agree with me, Mr. Schellenberger, that transparency is the most important thing. And my last question for you is, do you think it would be transparent if Hunter Biden came to this Congress and testified in a public hearing and more transparent than if he testified privately. It's, I mean, literally, I've never thought about that. I have no idea. <laughs> you don't I've know? I've never thought about is that. public the testimony time, more I mean, transparent than private testimony? Here. Are you familiar with the First Mr. Amendment? Mr. Chairman, I yield that back. The Congress shall take no action it, it, to abridge freedom of speech. Yeah. And, and that's what you just described. Mr. Schellenberger, is 13% censorship still censorship? Absolutely. And the other 87% is what we call the chilling effect that the courts have long recognized that they engaged in. You have that to, is the problem. There's a broad, op by the way, part of the operation, Congressman Holy Goldman, cow. part of the operation was to change the terms of service. So you see them constantly trying to change the terms of service. You see them, it was 35% of, of the URLs that were, this according to EIP, so were labeled, removed, or soft blocked. That's all forms of censorship. That censorship is not just removal. But 65% were not. So how can the government be so, so coercive? So does the First were, Amendment say that the government can censor the time of the First Amendment say the government can censor the the has They're expired. not censoring. They're flagging in the social Chair media companies. So under coercion, 35% of a First Chair, Amendment? Or? Chair it's not the First Amendment. It's the terms of service, as you said, and they oh. are flagging it for the social media companies to make their own decisions. <laughs> that is not the First Amendment. That is the terms of service. We have just seen the Congressman, you're an attorney. You know that the four federal judges have already ruled that and I know that it's on appeal in front of the Supreme Court right now okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, this that debate was very constructive. Ooh, that was I fun. think that got to the heart of the issue that's that's the problem right there that's, the that, gentlelady that's from right. Wyoming is recognized for five minutes thank you you know when you were here in March I commented that sunshine is the best disinfectant and that this place needs to be fumigated we've been working hard to do that over the last seven months but it hasn't been easy and our work continues 
Mr. Schellenberger, when you last testified before our subcommittee, you responded to a question from Chairman Jordan when he asked about the Hunter Biden laptop story, and I'm gonna quote what you said. You said, quote, now maybe the FBI agents were going to Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and to Twitter executives were warning about a, and were warning about a hack and leak potentially involving Hunter Biden. Maybe those guys didn't have anything to do with the guys that had the laptop. We just don't know. Well, you know what? Now we do know. And we know after interviewing Laura Demlo, who at the time of the Hunter Biden laptop story was on the Foreign Influence Task Force, she, we have learned from her that she and others on that task force did in fact know about the laptop before the New York Post story broke and they knew it was his. In other words, the work done in the year since the release of the Twitter files has continued to expose the extent of the censorship industrial complex. These discoveries show the importance of your testimony and the oversight work that has been done by this committee. What do you think this shows in terms of the complexity and scope of the censorship industrial complex? What I mean by that is even though with the trove of information that you released over a year ago or approximately a year ago, we're still filling in the gaps to understand the extent of what the federal government has engaged in in terms of violating the First Amendment. Yeah, I think what it, I mean, one of the most important things that it shows is that the censorship is in service of disinformation. It wasn't that they prevented the New York Post from publishing. It wasn't even that, that, that they did, the tweet eventually did come back um, on Twitter, it was eventually allowed. But the disinformation that was planted that my, myself and all my family and friends believed was that there was something fraudulent about the Hunter Biden laptop, which we now know was actually the Hunter Biden laptop. It's been verified now by all the major media and everybody else. So, but it created the perception that it was uh, misinformation by the Russians. And of course that conspiracy theory continues to be peddled today. So that's what it did. And, and that's how these guys at CTIL thought about it. That's how all of these operatives that are used to waging disinformation campaigns and psyops in foreign countries turned those tools against the American people. And, and that that's is, the critical point. They have been yes. turned against the American people. Absolutely. Uh, what do you think about the fact that the FBI agents warning Twitter about a hack and leak were the same agents who knew that the, uh, of the existence and le legitimacy of that laptop? What do you think about those people? I, it's shock. I mean, it's sh I mean, I, I, like you said, I was trying to only report on what we knew at the time, but obviously when that came out, it's absolutely shocking that you would have FBI sitting on this information in 2019 and then seeding the idea that there would be a hack and leak coming. I mean, it wasn't just Aspen Institute, it was also Stanford came out and they used that as a, pre, as a pretext to attack the Pentagon Papers principle upheld by the Supreme Court that when journalists like us are leaked information, we can publish it and we're protected by the First Amendment. We saw Stanford, we saw Stanford Institute attacking that precedent and saying journalists should no longer follow the Pentagon Papers principle. They should no longer report on information leaked to them. They should not do what Matt and I and Alex just did with publishing these files, leaked to us by a patriotic whistleblower mm -hmm. who, was who knew absolutely that this was wrong, that it was a violation of the First Amendment, that it was a violation of it in the spirit and the letter. And that's the kind of, I mean, to see these institutions of the establishment argue against this great American tradition of journalism and the First Amendment, it's quite appalling. It's shocking. Shocking. Um, Ms. Sabramanya, here in the House we are exposing the U.S. government censorship by proxy, which uses social media companies, academia, and private companies to circumvent the First Amendment. At the same time, we are watching with horror as liberal democracies in Europe and Canada are not even trying to hide their efforts to center, censor their citizens. We know where this is going, and without exposure and reform, we could be doomed to the same fate. In your opening statement, you discussed the impacts of the Online News Act and the other censorship efforts seen in European nations, and you issue a stern warning that I hope all Americans will take to heart. Could you describe the trends that you are seeing and specifically what tools or mechanisms of control these governments are trying to exert over free speech? Um, thank you for that question. Um, some of the examples are from my testimony, so debanking is one obvious um, uh, tool that the Canadian government, in a sense, has pioneered as far as Western liber liberal democracies are concerned. China has been doing that for years, but it's now come to the West. Um, and they went after peaceful protesters uh, um, uh, and, and punished them, weaponized the financial system, weaponized the government against them to teach them a lesson. Uh, you can't do this ever again. 
And, uh, and this sort of thing has a chilling effect on people's ability to express themselves freely. And that's certainly happened in Canada. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what's happening in Ireland, again, another country that I've mentioned, what's happening in France, the EU directive on uh, online speech. Um, all of these things are just extremely problematic. And what is, what, I want to say something here. What, what is under threat here is a core value of Western civilization. That's right. That is what is being undermined here. And that goes back to the Enlightenment. That is what we have to fight for. And the way you tackle misinformation, disinformation, all of these things which are um, bandied about loosely by people who want to censor you, the best solution to these things is more robust debate, and that goes back to the Enlightenment period, and that's what I want everybody to remember. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Taibbi, Mr. Schellenberger. Thank you for battling for all of us. Thank you for working so hard to protect our First Amendment rights. We really, really yeah. are terribly indebted to you, and you as well, Janine. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back to Mr. Manier. Well said. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 2017, as some of you may recall, one of Trump's first official actions as president was to issue the chaotic executive order barring any travel from seven predominantly Muslim countries, effectively serving as a Muslim ban. He continued these attacks on immigrant communities throughout his presidency. And he has promised to strip immigrants, if elected again, of their benefits and work permits, execute the largest deportation effort in American history, strip immigrant children of American citizenship even if they're born here, and reinstate and expand the Muslim ban. Ms. Troy, you were an advisor in the White House when the Muslim travel ban was implemented. Can you tell us as a national security expert um, how that, what happened when that ban took place? Was there advice given before the president issued that? Sure, there were uh, numerous discussions, and just to clarify, during the travel ban time, I was at DHS. Um, I was uh, uh, the lead intelligence officer on the travel ban, coordinating the entire community. Uh, there were significant discussions on intelligence assessments conducted. I will say that there were heated discussions and meetings where uh, members of the Trump administration, loyalists who wanted to override community intelligence assessments to suit the countries that they wanted on the list. Um, there was uh, significant pushback. There was advice from career intelligence officers, senior intelligence officers like myself, uh, about, about the threshold of, the, of, of these assessments. I will tell you that uh, it went to the extent where there were senior officials uh, Googling what they considered to be intelligence input and sending it to me to be included in official community coordinated intelligence assessments and saying that those were facts, uh, which was appalling to me because that is not how the intelligence community, it's not how we operate. Um, so there were numerous situations like that where that was the kind of uh, sort of um, dynamic that we faced um, on critical issues like this with which impact uh, numerous matters of national security that I can't get into because they're classified, but. Those matters of national security when discussing certain countries and the impacts of the travel ban were, were serious and they were raised. So in the execution of that travel ban, can you explain to us or share with us um, the interagency um, actions in the immediate announcement of the travel ban? How, was this something that had been worked through? No. How did that happen? Uh, no, we were blindsided uh, by uh, when it was issued. Uh, especially at DHS, um, as you saw, it was horrible. There was chaos at the airports, which you saw. Uh, we did not have the proper time to figure out how we were going to implement this executive order. There was no coordination of how we would carry these things out, especially in the aftermath of it. I remember CBP agents sitting at airports and TSA, it's like everyone was mass confusion about what was happening. Uh, the leadership of the department was not consulted or given a heads up. Um, that is kind of how that played out at the beginning. And this is from um, a newly elected president who did not understand the levers of power that he had upon coming into office. I can only imagine in the next administration, should he be elected, 
what he would do understanding that. An individual who has a long history of racist controversies, who has xenophobia in his usage of what he has done. 1991 book by John O'Donnell in Trump's criticism of a black accountant. He says, black guys counting my money, I hate it. The only kind of people I want counting my money are short guys that wear yarmulkes every day. I think that the guy is lazy and it's probably not his fault because laziness is a trait in blacks. It really is. I believe it's out of his control. And when questioned about it, he said the stuff O'Donnell said about me is probably true. This is an individual who, when he was in the White House, uh, denied making the comment about shithole countries that people should go back to, although senators, U.S. senators, present at the meeting said that it would happen. Ms. Troy, you signed a statement with over 130 national security experts that explained how Trump had routinely vilified immigrants in this country, which among other things makes him unfit to be the commander in chief. Many of us are offended when he demonizes individuals, immigrants from a moral and personal perspective, but what effect does it practically have on national security stability when Trump broadly demonizes immigrant groups in this country? Well, I am the daughter of immigrants. My mom is a Mexican immigrant, and I am of Mexican descent, and I which, will say- Which the president said were rapists, right? Correct, I remember that. And I will say that it leads to anti-immigrant sentiment. It leads to attacks on immigrants. It leads to uh, situations like when they repeat the great replacement narratives, it leads to mass shootings, like the one in El Paso at the Walmart where my aunt was in when the shooter claimed, talked about the Hispanic invasion of Texas. It leads to situations like that. It leads to uh, the violence and hate that you are continuing to see in the divisiveness of this country. I will tell you that uh, it also speaks to um, another scenario that I remember clearly was when Trump kept calling it the China virus and he did it on purpose and it was the attacks on Asian people in this country increased during the pandemic. That is one thing that I know was uh, recognized internally in the White House that that rhetoric would increase attacks on Asian Americans here, and Asians in our country. I will tell you that Mike Pence took that very seriously. He did not use that lingo because he knew that it would lead to these types of hateful acts that we're still seeing in our country today. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, we have one more questioner. I, I don't know about Ms. Sanchez, but I think we have Mr. Armstrong on our side, and I'll give the ranking member a couple minutes for some thank yous and closing comments. I'll just take a minute or two, and then we'll be done. So if we can hang with us. Mr. Armstrong is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Upstairs, the CDC director is testifying in front of an oversight committee hearing. And when I get a chance to go up there, I'm going to ask them about the CDC buying, <clears throat> using taxpayers' data to buy location on American citizens to see if they comply with COVID lockdown. And down here, we're talking about censorship and social media. And the reason I bring those two things up is because I think they're, the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment are what make the United States unique in the world. There's no other government in this, on this planet that has such robust protections of both speech and privacy. They've also held up and been, and been incredibly resilient throughout the course of time. The Fourth Amendment has dealt with listening devices and drones and telephoto lenses. And the First Amendment, you talked about Skokie versus Illinois. The problem is, is I don't know if they survived the digital age, not without Congress's help. And we're gonna deal with the Fourth Amendment and privacy and all of that. But the First Amendment means that the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall, pretty smart guy. And the problem we run into with the government's current and extensive efforts to censor speech on social media comes down to a few essential questions. What is permissible speech? and who decides what's permissible speech. So we've talked about it, and we've alluded to it, and we've, we've written a report about it, but I wanna talk just really briefly. Mr. Schellenberger, what is the election, election Integrity Partnership? What is it? So the Election Integrity Partnership was, uh, uh, the idea for it came from the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security uh, agency. It was a collaboration of four NGOs really led by Stanford Internet Observatory to uh, uh, flag content and urge 
the social media platforms to censor it in one way or another, whether to take it down or put a label on it or throttle it. And the government was involved in funding it and creating it? Correct. Was it effective? Uh, it, it was, as we were discussing, it resulted in uh, it action on 30, I mean, they respond, the platforms responded 75% to 75% of the uh, content that was being flagged by the EIP, and then in 35% of those cases, they took action. Mr. Taibbi, you earlier wanted to jump in on this subject, and I'm gonna allow you an opportunity to talk. The question is, is was the government involved and engaged in censoring speech leading up to the 2020 election? Yes, I think so, absolutely. I mean, through the EIP and through a variety of other means. Um, I think it was, it's also worth pointing out, you, you brought up uh, the purchasing of geolocation data. Um, many of the companies that uh, do social media monitoring are also in the business of selling geolocation data uh, to the government. So it's a very similar pattern, even though there's been a Supreme Court ruling uh, that says that you can't get geolocation data without a warrant. I believe it was uh, uh, Carpenter v. Yeah, United States, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it subsequently came out that uh, multiple agencies were, were doing that anyway through middleman companies. And this is basically the same pattern that we see with speech with groups like the EIP or CTIL. Um, it's, it's essentially a workaround, uh, a legal workaround. Well, and I think we're going to the net, and it didn't quit in 2020, we're gonna to get to that, but I mean, the problem is, is we define misinformation and disinformation very differently, and what I've come to figure out what it means from the government is anything critical of the government. But it's already evolved from that. You know, I sat in um, Brennan's transcribed interview, and he just blatantly said, I don't care if it's true or not. And in, two, in June of 2021, CISA's Countering Foreign Influence Task Force created a mis, dis, and malinformation team, the MDM team. What is malinformation, mm -hmm. Mr. Schallenberger? That's uh, accurate information that could lead people to have the wrong conclusion. So the main example of this is often true stories of vaccine side effects that might lead people to be hesitant about taking the vaccine. So not only were they censoring information they deemed to be inaccurate, they were censoring accurate information, and they're continuing to do it now. Not only that, but both CTIL and uh, the leaders of the Stanford Internet Observatory emphasized that malinformation was the main event. Stopping narratives was the main event. It was their main focus. The smaller stuff, the inaccurate tweets, that was less of a concern. They were really focused on the big objectives, in this case, making sure people took the vaccines. So an agency funded and created by the government, a partnership funded and created by the, or by the government's number one stated goal is to censor true information. And whole narratives, whole ways of thinking. That should terrify everybody, Democrat, Republican, Independent, yeah. young, old, anybody else. May I, add one, may I add one thing, Congressman? Sure. Which is just that if, if you know, the Democrats are very, very concerned about President Trump, I would ask them, if they're so concerned about President Trump, would you want him to control the censorship apparatus? Would you want that, given all the things that you've said? Would okay. you like him to be able to call Twitter and Facebook and all these other platforms and demand that they censor content? Doesn't seem consistent to me. Well said. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the ranking member for a closing comment, and then, then we'll, uh, we'll close the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank the witnesses for being here. I, I too, want to thank our witnesses. Ms. Troy, thank you for being here. Ms. Subramana, thank you. You said just a few minutes ago that this is about Western civilization. I think our, our, uh, the gentleman from North Dakota said it well. The First Amendment, Fourth Amendment are, are at the heart of that. And that's, that's why we're doing this. Uh, so thank you. And, uh, and frankly, I think you're, uh, I just met you today, but you, you strike me as almost too nice because it's, it's, it's not debanking, it's stealing, it's taking. They're taking someone's property. And that's what they did to this, this guy who served in the Canadian amount of, amount of police and what they frankly are, I, I hope doesn't ever happen in, in this country. But thank you for being here. It was very good. And, and to our witnesses, Mr. Tybe, Mr. Schellenberg, thank you for coming back. I think the Democrats said that, um, we should, that we've do, this is like a quarterly thing. I, I think we should make it a quarterly thing. I mean, the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment are that darn important. Uh, and but for your work a year ago, you two guys and a few others, I don't know that we'd have all the information we have. So, you know, someday someone's going to write the history books and they're going to recognize folks like you who, who are willing to stand up, frankly, coming from the other party 
because most of the censorship has been against conservatives and Republicans, but some are Democrat, and I'm against all of it. They're gonna write, when they write the history, they're gonna say these two guys stepped forward along with a few others to, to, to bring this to, uh, uh, to make the country aware of this. And then we have done now four reports on CISA, on the FTC, on this gyra ticketing system that the EIP and the Stanford, uh, all these guys are working on. Uh, and others that, and it, but it started there. So again, thank you, and we'll have you back if you'll come. We'll definitely have you back too, Ms. Subramanya. You, you, were, you were great. So thank you all for being here, and that concludes today's hearing. Thank you.